office so much. And later, Fran Drescher told us why every human should own a pet. And our buddy Leah Remini revealed what she likes to watch. It might surprise some people. All right, that was a good teaser for you. Let's get to today's first item. It's Nancy Cartwright. She might be the most recognizable voice from The Simpsons because she plays Bart Simpson. She's the voice. She's been behind the naughty and rebellious Bart for 30 years in The Simpsons, and she told us what it's been like to be part of such an iconic show. You know, when I was cast as Bart, it was like, it was such a dream come true for me because I think everybody has a little bit of Bart Simpson in him or her, you know, in them. <laughs> It's true. We all have these personalities. We're we're a, we're such a, a such a conglomeration of so many personalities. I describe Bart Simpson as being a ten year old school hating underachiever and proud of it. That was the description that I read in the original audition when I went, and I was supposed to go in for Lisa, but I decided I wanted to do Bart and he just seemed more interesting than an eight year old middle child. His description was so much more clear. So I went in and Matt Groening was there and I had an idea in mind and I said, blah, 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 blah. He's like, oh my God, that's him, that's Bart. And I was hired, boom, on the spot. <laughs> Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? I think Bart Simpson has probably got the most catchphrases of anyone. It's, I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? Eat my shorts, get bent, no way man, cowabunga, whoa mama. I mean, all these things are like, whoa, <laughs> score. It's such a hard question to answer about like, what's my favorite, I don't really, it's kind of like asking who's your favorite kid. There's a good handful of episodes that definitely rank up there. Some of my favorites are the musicals. I love the musicals, like Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, that's a really good one. Cause that's that takeoff on Mary Poppins and Sherry Bobbins is so funny and the singing of it is just crazy. You know, if you want to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. If you wish to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. Help us with math and book reports. Might I add, eat my shorts. Bart! Oh, when Bart gets an F. That's the title of it. It's the first show of the second season. And kind of humbly speaking, I guess, modestly speaking, that one, it got a lot of attention. And it takes Bart it turns him into, from the first 13 that we did the first season, that episode really shows you a level of Bart Simpson that you had never seen before. And he goes into, he just gets really, really sad. And he's super sincere about how he tried to study. And he starts to cry because he feels like he's going to flunk the fourth grade. And um, that, that stands out in my mind. <laughs> The matter? Well, I would think you'd be used to failing by now. No, you don't understand. I really tried this time. I mean, I really tried. Early on in the show, um, it was made very clear to us that, that the actors are not the stars of the show, that the characters are the stars of the show, and I, nobody had any problem with that. I don't think anybody had any idea that the show was going to go on, you know, 33 plus years and, and turn into the icon that it is. But we instead were all like armpit to armpit, elbow to elbow in one little tiny booth that was not meant for recording in. So we had like moving carpets up on the walls because they were one big wall was all glass. And when we spoke, it would vibrate. So they had to put a carpet in front of it and we would all share the same microphone armpit check you know uh, um, and here I am very pregnant it was a lot of um, give and take from from all of us actors but it was I, I look at that and like that is such a such a humble modest beginning for what came to be you know it's pretty cool when I meet fans it's like it's, it's pretty cool because most of the time I'm not recognized. Most of the time I'm just this anonymous celebrity and it doesn't matter where I am, nobody, because I don't look like him, my skin's not yellow, nine spikes, I'm not a 10 year old boy. 
but I can have more causation over revealing who I really am. And so if it's just a spontaneous thing and I'm talking to somebody and I ask them, so what's your name? And they say, oh, my name's Katie. And I'll say, oh, hi, Katie. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? And it is just like the jaw drops to the ground. And it's equally fun for me. It still is to this day. I love surprising people. And it's kind of a cool thing. It sometimes pops people out of their funk. And isn't that kind of what we need right now? We need some kind of enlightenment. We need some humor, some lightness, some aesthetics. One question that people like to ask me is, why is The Simpsons so successful? How has it lasted this, this long? And I think it just, it, it actually doesn't even matter what, this is funny to say this, what decade you look at, because we're, <laughs> we're in our third decade. That's crazy. But no matter what decade you look at, The Simpsons has a consistency in the, the business model, in you know, the way that it's done. It's got this family that has its own kind of rules or, or lack, of, lack of rules. And they're kind of a nice, quote unquote, normal family. And I do think they represent a lot of people that can say, wow, that's us. You know, whether it's the Simpsons or all the citizens of Springfield, it's like people can find things that they can relate to. And that has been such a success and the tip of the hat to the writers and the executives on the show. Thanks to Nancy for sharing all those memories with us. Next up, we're revisiting the Dunder Mifflin Paper Company with the office star, Brian Baumgartner. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. We have Scranton, Pennsylvania on the mind for this next flashback interview. Hard to believe it's been 17 years since the premiere of The Office, the hit TV show about the work lives of paper company employees. Brian Baumgartner played the lovable Kevin Malone and weighed in on why he thinks people still love the show so much. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. At least once a year, I like to bring in some of my Kevin's famous chili. I want to eat a pig in a blanket. In a blanket. Nope, it's not Ashton Kutcher. It's Kevin Malone. Equally handsome, equally smart. Well, Kevin Malone, <laughs> how would I describe Kevin Malone? Uh, I think Kevin Malone is uh, a man of uh, some unique skills um, who uh, is, is misunderstood in a way. His childlike sensibility fits into the rest of the ensemble of The Office um, very well. I had such a blast playing him and, and continue to be delighted by, by how fans re react to him. I do think that of all of the other actors and, and, and characters uh, on The Office, I do think that, that probably I'm the most dissimilar uh, to mine. My Kleenex shoes were a huge conversation piece 
but man, my dogs are barking. But, you know, look, I loved, I, I loved his ability um, to be in the moment. I used to say he has no memory of what happened before or any ramifications for what might happen uh, in the future. But in the moment, he, uh, if he enjoyed a moment, he was willing to show it. Um, often didn't think too far ahead, but I had, uh, I had a blast playing with him. And, and you know, our little, uh, our little group in the corner, the accountants, Oscar and Angela and Kevin, I, I describe it as, as kind of a perfect comedy triangle. Well, I need to give my cat up for adoption. Mm. The one who uses the doorbell or the one with the Mexican hat or the one with the rain galoshes or the one that you let go around naked. Which had nothing to do with us, which had to do with the, the writers and the construction of the characters. But um, the way that the alliances kept shifting, their specific personalities and how they played off of each other uh, was so much fun to do for, for almost a decade. I think for me now, my favorite episode would have to be Stress Relief. Um, otherwise known as uh, the Dwight's fake fire drill. Oh, here's the door. Check that one out. How's the handle? And it's warm. Okay, go to the back well, door. Well, uh, another option. Another option. Jeez. Okay, settle down, everyone. And I think, you know, for me now, um, there's so many great episodes, but I, I think for me, what was happening outside of the show uh, carries special significance for me as well. So I think it's a hilariously funny, well-written episode. I saw a friend today, it had been a while. We forgot each other's name. A lot of things spring to mind thinking about the finale. I basically shot the show my 30s. My whole 30s was dedicated to being together, which is, is high school and college, and then two more years, uh, spending a lot of time with those people. So, you know, it was really knowing that whatever happened, the, the friendships would be there, um, the relationships would, would remain, but we wouldn't be spending 60 to 70 hours a week together anymore. And that, that was gonna be a, a huge change uh, for us. So uh, a huge feeling of loss, uh, but also tremendously proud of the journey that we had and the fact that we chose to end it. We had a story that we wanted to tell and we made sure that, that we got that story in uh, and told it you know, largely with with the original people who were, were cast. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone who was on the show could have ever guessed that the show would end up doing, um, becoming what it has become today. I mean, we were, we were almost, we almost made a pilot and was never on the air. And then, you know, the fact that that an audience picked up on it, I always knew what we were doing was special. If people gave it a chance, I just thought. Well, people aren't going to give it a chance. So um, I'm I'm tremendously uh, proud of the show. As I say to people, I'm I'm a fan of the show, and 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 love watching it, and, and I'm so proud to have been a part of it. You know, in in examining through this book that I have coming out, Welcome to Dunder Mifflin. You know, one of the things that we are looking at is why the show has not just survived, but has thrived eight years after we have filmed any anything and I think that it's really about the people uh, it's really about the construction of, of of the idea and the aesthetic of the show that was so really revolutionary and groundbreaking at the time but the hiring of the specific actors to play the roles and the writing staff that was brought in which are now the top comedy writers in television today you know it was just a, a special and unique collection of people uh, led by Greg Daniels, who, you know, created the show um, and uh, and his genius in, in, in finding the perfect people for their job. That's really why I think. What a classic. We love that show in our house. Hope you enjoyed that one. Office fans, it was for you. Coming up, we've got nanny star Fran Drescher sharing the key to easing her anxiety. It happens to be her furry friend. Good evening from New 
New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world, because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. Did you know that Fran Drescher is a huge, huge dog lover? She's even had a famous dog of her own. Get this, Chester, that's the dog on the nanny, was actually Fran's real-life dog. She told us all about that and how her pets have shaped her life in this episode of our series, My Pet Tale. I start on the nanny and I wrote a part for my first dog ever, Chester Drescher. Oh, Chester, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Nanny, fine, please. He doesn't like strangers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Chester was an amazing dog because he was extremely consistent in his behavior. We knew what he would do under certain circumstances. So we wrote towards that. And that was why every time, you know, Cece Babcock grabbed him away from me, we knew that he would growl. Oh, how thoughtful. <laughs> so we always had her do that. You need some time to get used to you. I mean, you can't expect a dog to just jump into your arms and love you at first sight. That's the Sheffield. Oh, you got her a puppy. Oh, how sweet. Oh, look how friendly. And it was great working with him because he was always on the set anyway. I'm always of the camp, must love dogs. I have a, a dog now, uh, Angel Grace, and I rescued her just days before lockdown. And then she rescued me. And for the first couple of months of our relationship at my house, you know, it was just her and me. I don't think she really uh, knew what was happening. <laughs> But all of a sudden, you know, it was just the two of us for a couple of months. And so it really did bond us. And we're very, very close now. And she's three years old and I travel with her and she's my service animal. So I'm just very grateful to have the first big dog I've ever had. And, you know, she uh, gives me added security and, uh, and helps me through situations that sometimes would otherwise um, make me anxious. She's kind of different shades of white and bone. And I thought she was so loving when I met her at the rescue place and so sweet uh, that uh, I said, you know, are you an angel? Did Samson send you to me? And Samson was the dog that sadly I uh, had died just days earlier uh, from a stroke. I said, are you an angel? Is that your name? And it just seemed suitable to her because she is such an angel. She is definitely a big part of the family. She's got all these other mothers who come and take care of her if I have to go out of town and I can't take her with me. 
Dog is God spelled backwards, and I think that dogs are here to teach us unconditional love, to remind us that there's room in our hearts to love another, even if we've loved and lost. And I think that every human should experience unconditional love. It's just a, a bond between two species that really is unparalleled. I just, you know, couldn't live without having a canine to love and care for and feel loved by and share my bed with. Just be there as a friend and a companion and company, a wonderful company. In fact, as a cancer survivor, you know, I always tell other people recently diagnosed, make sure your pet sleeps in the bed with you because at night is when your imagination and fear starts to run wild because you don't have the distractions of the day. And if you don't have a pet, get one. Well, it's really nice to hear people's pet stories. They mean so much. All right, still to come, Leah Remini breaks down her must-watch list. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. And welcome back. We absolutely love learning more about our friend Leah Remini. When she can't fall asleep, she turns to one particular show, and it just might surprise you. She spoke to us for our What I Watch series. When I have to fall asleep, when I can't fall asleep, I put on forensic files. Don't know why, listening to stories, people being murdered, gets me to sleep. That's probably, I mean, a psychologist would probably have an answer. It was a delivery he never expected. The older version of Forensic Files, the guy's voice, it's so soothing. And he's like, and then they found her decapitated. Something about the guy's voice. I don't know what it is. What I watch when I need comfort food is a reality show. Pick any one, Housewives of any state. Or I watch a Love Island, or I watch Below Deck. Basically, Bravo. What I love about reality shows in general is that I just feel like it takes me away. Like, it's a mind vacation. I. I, I find myself not multitasking in my brain, like when I'm watching something um, that's you know newsworthy, I start to think about all the things I need to do in my life, things I'm not doing right. Um, I think I should be a better daughter, a better mother, a better this, a better aunt, a better sister, you know. But when I watch reality shows, it's almost like my mind is suspended. It is literally frozen. And I mean, I, the picture of, I get of myself while I'm watching reality shows is just kind of drool. Kind of, it isn't, but I, like, that's what I picture myself doing because it's so mind numbing. My daughter Sophia got me onto Love Island, but only UK versions. Like, she, you know, we find that to be the better versions of, of, of Love Island. 
it's a little riskier. Um, so I, I really tend to, to go to those or like I'll watch a marathon of like say yes to the dress. It's the not having to think about changing the channel or, you know, so it's usually if I see there's five, six, seven, eight seasons of something, I'm in because then somehow I like fall asleep and then I'm like, wait, well, how'd I get on season four? And it's just anything that has multiple seasons. What I watch that might surprise people, I don't know that what I watch might surprise people. I do watch a lot of documentaries. I don't know that that's surprising to people, but when people talk about documentaries, they're like, you probably haven't seen this. I'm like, seen it. Like, I'll watch a documentary on uh, flies. Like, I just love documentaries. It doesn't really matter what it is. I just love uh, real stories. Sitting here traffic on the Queensboro Bridge tonight. I didn't need to prepare for the King of Queens because I am Carrie. Um, there's no need for me to prep. Oh, she's a girl from Brooklyn married to a neighborhood guy who has a crazy father in her basement. Like there was nothing I needed to prep for. I knew the character. I know the character very well. But you know what's funny about the King of Queens is that I remember um, our producers when I first got the role, we did a pilot and our executive producer was like, you know, why do you, why are you wearing makeup? And I was like, first of all, have you been to a borough in New York? Like, you know what I mean? Like Queens, Brooklyn, what do, like the idea of what a borough, per, like was like, they don't get their nails done. They don't wear makeup. And I was like, first of all, everything from a borough, like I'm from Bensonhurst. Don't tell me, like, I didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my stuff was coordinated. You know, like my outfits were matching the shirt, you know, back in my day, it was matching your shirt with your socks and like everything was color coordinated. So like the idea of what somebody from New York is like was so off. And I was like, no, no, I, this girl gets her nails done. This girl gets her hair done. This girl, like, cause this girl is me. So. We're not doing sweatpants and, and I go, and by the way, if we wear sweatpants, it's color coordinated. What, what I watched when I did a good cry, oh my God. Terms of endearments, um, the notebook. Steel Magnolias. It's about friendships. It's about family. It's about um, losing people that you love. I mean, it's just, and the notebook just like, just kills me. I just, every time. There's not a time. And then um, Moulin Rouge. I know that sounds crazy, but I cry every time. Every time she dies. Every time. I've seen it 56 times, probably just in the last year. It's a wonderful life. Every holiday, crying. Every time, every time. What I watch with my family is anything my daughter wants to watch. It's not um, done by votes or even what her parents would want to watch because as they get older, they have their own rooms, they have their own computers, they can watch whatever they want to watch. So if my daughter says, I want to watch such and such, with you guys, I'm like, K okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Whatever she wants to watch, I'm like, I will watch. Thanks to Leah for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. Well, there you have it. That was today's Popstar Plus. Thanks for being here and join us again tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye.
Welcome to the making of today. It's a show about how we bring the Today Show to you every single morning. For the next half hour, we are going to share the behind the scenes secrets from some of the biggest moments over the last few months. Are you ready to kick it off? All right, let's do it. First, we're going to peel back the curtain on a royal encounter. We got a look at the making of today from The Hague in the Netherlands, where Prince Harry hosted the 2022 Invictus Games back in April. Hoda sat down with the Duke of Sussex to hear about the event, his famous family, and life these days. Here's a glimpse at the action. The crew and I landed at The Hague about 24 hours before my interview with Prince Harry. We took an overnight flight to get here. So everybody's blurry because I, I, I watched a Barb and Star on the plane for one hour and then ate and just ate and stayed up. So I'm, I'm delirious. So what we're going to have to figure out is how to wrap this day up, try to get some rest because the interview's tomorrow morning in Netherlands time. So we are going to wrap that interview fast. Like with so much of our work, we are up against the clock. We're going to get the piece cut overnight so that when we land in, in the United States at 7.30 p.m. Tuesday, by Wednesday morning it'll be ready. And just to show you how magical we are, we're actually going to get a chunk of it on nightly news Tuesday night. So we're going to be, it's going to be a full-on, all-out sprint, and it's worth every second. Here on the ground, in advance of my interview, I want to not just read in, but I also want to attend the Invictus Games. Yes. You just got a gold medal. Oh my God, you did? Yes. Congratulations, you. that's awesome. So that when I sit down with Prince Harry, I can speak from my experience. It's now the day of the interview and things got really exciting really quickly. We're about a half hour before we start rolling with Prince Harry. Hoda's already actually met him. She, as we got out of the car, randomly he was walking in a very Hoda-esque moment. They saw each other, they greeted each other. We got about a half hour to go, so we're pretty excited. Give me the crucial part is here because you're on F2E. You gotta make sure that you're focused, okay? Yeah. Right now there's a couple things happening. Hoda's sort of focusing in on sort of the conversation and what she's gonna do and how she thinks that the, the interview's gonna play out. And then there's also the crews, which are working on background, lighting, we're checking everything, making sure that we're in touch with New York. There's a lot going on right now, a lot going on. And in royal fashion, Prince Harry arrived on time and ready. My job is here with these guys and giving them the support I can and try to work out what and how I'm gonna do my closing speech. <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna say? I don't know yet. Yeah. I, otherwise, if I knew I would, I wouldn't tell you. Um, <laughs> My conversation was as interesting as I'd hoped for, and I have to say Prince Harry was kind, honest, and reflective. My sort of mantra now every day is, and it's, it's, it's a dangerous one because I need to make sure that I don't have burnout, but is trying to make the world a better place for my kids. Mm. Otherwise, what's the point in bringing kids into this world? And the determination of these athletes and the support of their families will leave a mark on me forever. You know, you land and you have a quick turn, and they always tell you a quick turn. You got to go in there and shoot and get out. Well, I'm here, okay? I have met people who I won't forget who've inspired me. Now, from one famous Harry to another, music superstar Harry Styles joined us on the plaza for a huge concert with tons of fans. And our crew didn't let the rain get in the way of this big day. Here's how our team made it happen. Another <laughs> rainy day in New York. No, with Harry. <laughs> Yes, that Harry. Harry Styles kicked off our summer concert series and brought the music. The fans. We love you, Harry! And an early morning for our Today Show family. It is about 1.45 a.m. It's 3.20. We got here at 3 a.m. Pouring rain. Pouring rain. Producers Katie Ryan and Kevin Chattel have been planning this concert for weeks. When we found out it was Harry Styles, we both raised our hands immediately and we were like, please, please let us take this on. Katie's been around longer than I have, so she knows the ropes and I can lean on her. But the one drizzle on the plan, waking up to rain. The most challenging part of this concert, seeing the crew working harder than I've ever seen before. Sweeping water off the stage just constantly. Everyone's running around looking for towels, trying to clean up everything. It is a lot to manage. Our production designer, Ed Helbig, created the stage. We adjusted on the fly about a day and a half ago to bring in a stage with a roof. Um, but we've been working on it for a few weeks and we definitely worked with the artist to make sure that the stage configuration worked for how he was gonna perform. Ed and his team arrived 24 hours before the concert. 
It's really miraculous to see it all come together in such a short amount of time. Harry's fans lined up hours before the big show. I have to hold this the entire no, time? No, no, you are not going to hold that the entire time. That's not happening. Our team facilitated over 6,000 fans, one of our largest concerts ever. We worked with our security and the NYPD to make sure that everything was ready for loading for our audience members. It's 5.40 a.m. We're loading the guests in. Everyone's so excited. <laughs> You can see these barricades too. These are like the industrial barricades to keep everyone safe. With the fans loaded in, now it's time for Harry's rehearsal. I don't know if you today all day peeps out there are aware, but we had the artists come out around 6 a.m. to make sure to check their audio levels, make sure everything looks good, sounds good. And from that moment on, we don't stop. People may not realize or see is how we're always kind of setting up three steps ahead. So while something's happening, while Harry might be performing one song, we're setting up what's going to happen after the next commercial break and making sure the anchors that are part of the next segment are where they're supposed to be. During a concert, he can find most of us on the plaza, dancing and singing along. And in my case, twinning with Harry. Our team delivering the best show, making memories along the way. How do you feel? Relieved. Until we do it again, all summer long. And big props to our crew who had to set up and break Absolutely. down with all that rain. Yes. We love summer on the plaza. And up next, today on the road, how our third hour kicked off the best summer ever in South Carolina and Hoda and Jenna's big trip to the Big Easy. We'll be right back. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Welcome back to the making of today. In May, we took the third hour of today on the road. Thanks to our friends at Verbo, we headed to God's country, as Craig likes to call it, That's South right. Carolina. Yeah, we set sail for sunny Hilton Head Island to enjoy beautiful views, incredible food, and to make a few memories along the way. And here's how it all came together. What better way to kick off summer than to take the third hour to Hilton Head Island, home of beautiful beaches, low country cuisine, and lots of fun in the sun. Guess what everybody, it's happening. A whole crew of the third hour today. We're headed to South Carolina and now, as much as we talk about it, now it feels real. While in flight, our Today Show crew was in South Carolina, setting up in our beautiful location. The minute we landed, we were greeted with a warm welcome, and it's off to our first location for a special shoot, a buddy up. It's time to get fishing. Our producer, Alicia, prepped us for what would be a fishy adventure. We are about to go out on the um, Calabogie Sound for a little shoot with the 9 a.m. town. Okay, so I'm on the chaser boat, which means we're going next to the main boat, and I'm listening to feed on this phone. Got Fuzzy here driving. And while we were shooting on the water, our producers were back at our gorgeous Verbo Beach House, getting ready with the crew for another late night shoot. We are planning uh, to finish wrapping up our very special opening. This very special mission of the After 
the show preps, we end the night with a beautiful sunset and team dinner. And finally, the big day is here, and the crew is working hard on making sure the lights, camera, and audio are ready to roll. So basically, we're just going through the rundown here. Um, of the first part of the show, we just kind of go through everything and see what's going on, so we know who's mic'd and who's being mic'd and what we're doing, and uh, that's basically where we start. So I printed the show rundown, so they're about to have a camera meeting with the stage manager, go over all the set locations, and this is all the info that they need to know. Then it's showtime. This is a special edition of the third hour of today, live from Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Yeah. And we couldn't forget to wish our good buddy Craig a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> That's a wrap on our time in God's country. None of it would have been possible without our amazing Today Show team. We had a blast. Oh, it was great. It was so fun. And speaking of, Hoda and Jenna always bring the fun, whether they're in the Big Apple or the Big Easy. Back in March, the dynamic duo headed to New Orleans for two special shows. They experienced local culture, food, and met up with some famous friends. Today, contributor Donna Farrison has an inside look how they got it all done. New Orleans is known for its delicious food, jazz music, and unforgettable culture. So whenever we head on down to the Big Easy, we know it's going to be a party. We are going to film two shows. We can't wait for the crowd, can't wait for the people, can't wait for the better weather, can't wait for the food. We just touched down in New Orleans, and what is the most important part? Food and cocktails. <laughs> so we're at, we're at our team dinner. He was doing a fabulous remote shoot. Let's go. So let the good times roll. Guess what I found, people who are excited for tomorrow. I am so excited. Hoda and Jenna. Go girls. We can't wait. I'm going to meet Hoda and Jenna at a crawfish boil, which Hoda's the queen of New Orleans, so we know that this is not her first crawfish boil. But I can't wait to see how their day went. Come with me. It was all New Orleans. Like we were, we were just yeah. inundated with everything New Orleans. Art, music, culture, food, poetry, drink, food, nice people, drinks. Wait, look, look at my shirt. Who that? Nola is my happy place. The person behind a lot of it, Amanda. Amanda's power. How did it go? We had a really fun day. We like went around the city. We took this everywhere. Can we eat now? Yes. <laughs> a successful crawfish boil. We had one of the busiest yet best two days working in this piece ever. You can't not have fun in New Orleans. Even when you're stressed, you're having fun. Now we're diving in. Yeah. From food time to show time. And it's the behind the scenes crew that helps make the magic happen. We'll go on the truck and we'll, uh, we'll just give you a quick okay. tour. You're on camera, I'm Donna. <laughs> it's like a cockpit. Like a cockpit. <laughs> You're on camera. Big crowd here in Jackson Square. And we're live. And with the band in full swing, the ladies went marching in. How do you think it's going? Amazing, the crowd is so great. Very unofficial. That's why the crowd's going crazy. And Hoda got to share her favorite city with her favorite girls. New Orleans never disappoints, and neither does our amazing team. We love Absolutely. a good trip. Absolutely. All right, and stick around because we'll be headed to our DC studio where our Saturday crew takes the helm. We'll be right back. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting. 
for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. During the week, we're here in Studio 1A, but on Saturdays, we pass the baton to our team in D.C. with our chief White House correspondents and Weekend Today co-anchors, Peter Alexander and Kristen Welker. Here's a look inside the Saturday Today operations, waking up your weekends from our nation's capital. All right, so it's 4.20 in the morning. It's about 4.30 in the morning. This is the part of the day that hurts. I just made my coffee so that I'll have some energy. Never in 18 years being at the Today Show have I had a cup of coffee. True story. So I just arrived at work before 5 a.m. And I have three minutes to make it upstairs before our editorial call. By 5 a.m., it's time for our first call to go over the show. Hey, Katie and Peter. Well, good. Good morning, guys. So, Katie, so, what do we have today? We so we're going to open up with Tamara doing a weather hit, break that okay. weather hit on the heat. Kristen the bag, and Peter to Jesse Kirsch, and you say goodbye, and that's it. While Kristen and I get ready, the control room here is buzzing. Where is everybody? Actually, while we're here in D.C., our control room team is in New York in 1A with their own morning routine. Morning coffee. By 6 a.m., we're finalizing scripts. Formula fears. Formula fears, good. And last looks. Is this on purpose or matching? It was a little bit on purpose. I think the blue is working. Three, Saturday, two, 21. Surgery open. Go time is show time, baby. Joining on Saturday, Samara Theodore and our friend Joe Fryer. Let's talk pocket square, more importantly. Pocket square? Yes. Strong. Do you want some real behind the scenes I do. This is my secret thing. So if you have a little thing like this, Saturday Night Live, only two episodes of the sketch show remain this season. The studio is constantly changing. Six. What's my motivation? Five, four. Three. Eurovision. Two. Uh. Well, the wildly popular Eurovision Song Contest will crown. That purple disco club is just one look we can do. Let's show you around our DC studio. This is the centerpiece, our studio and vibe, which we love. Take a look around with Spin James behind the camera. Spin us around, take a look. We'll join you on the other side. We have a bunch of different angles that we can use. And if you come this direction, look at our view. It's spectacular. We are literally just about a block and a half from the US Capitol. This is our giant wall. One of the coolest places. Yeah, no doubt. And so uh, when it's cold out, this thing cooks at like 150 yeah. degrees, so this room gets pretty warm. <laughs> Whenever we're doing a story, the backdrop a lot of times matches the theme of the story that we're doing. So. Speaking of matching, they take this shot of us, Welker. It looks like we're off to prom. It's prom season. I know. <laughs> we look like we're We're, we're matching. <laughs> One final thing we like to do each Saturday morning, the after party, our post-show recap on Instagram. Okay, now don't start rolling until I'm ready. Now my hair looks good. Yeah. Okay, okay. rolling. <laughs> Every Does time. Does it ever get old? Oh my god, there's gonna be an ice cream truck? That's like a real thing. Have a great weekend, guys. Have a good one. See you. Bye. How fun to see that DC I studio love that place. and snag an invite to the after party. Well, now we're inviting you to somewhere here in Studio 1A. 
our dressing rooms. Uh -oh. Okay, so Dylan starts off with a tour of her space. Come on in. I'm gonna walk backwards. It is very messy, but there's not much room. Got all my outfits here, my summer clothes. Uh, I often sometimes do my own makeup. So I've got that here, just food and <laughs> coffee and whatnot. But my favorite part of this whole room is my wall of art from Calvin and Oliver. They are constantly drawing every single day and I never know what to do with this stuff, but I have just hideous wallpaper. So I've been slowly covering it up with all of their artwork, um, the masterpieces, I think. So that's my dressing room. Come on in. Wait, I, this must be your shoes. So these are my shoes and then the shoes turn into the hoodies that I, don't, I wear into work <laughs> and I don't feel like wearing home. And now it's too hot to wear this, so they say. Hair for when I want to do a ponytail, uh, random things, hairpins, clothes. I just keep like a little extra stash. <laughs> Where do you fit? Hair products under here. Oh, wow. Yes. And then I did my makeup this morning. So makeup here. What's your favorite part of your dressing room? My favorite part of my dressing room is when I sit in this chair right here and I see all the people I love, like my work family and my real family. And then the fact that we were in the Highlights Magazine of all the accolades means so much to me because it was so special to me as a kid. So this is like my little happy place. Well, hello. What have you got going on in here? Wow, what have you got going on in here? Well, uh, let's see. Uh... Got my under desk treadmill. Uh, we got a standing desk. It's kind of good. Do you ever sit? Uh, no. Hmm. Uh, it's just yeah. You know, I'm never in here that long. To and, and when I'm not, when I'm in here, I like to get a few steps in and only get it up to about two and a half miles per hour. So yeah, you know, you're not you're not out of breath. And you have all your memories over here. All my stuff. Pictures from family, friends, memory. Wow. It's all happening. It's all here. So what is your favorite part of your dressing room? Um, I don't know. Just uh just it feels cozy. It's cozy, you know, it's nice. Stuff that, you know, means something to me and reminds me of all the parts of my life that I love, both professionally and personally. We each clearly have our own personal touches yes. in our dressing rooms. Al's, yours is clearly the nicest. Well, it smells the nicest. It is nice. <laughs> but our next stop needs more than a little tidying up. We're heading across the pond to show you how our crew put together a fascinating feature story. Just outside of Manchester, England, Molly Hunter met American producer and actor Hopwood Dupree. Now, he's traded Hollywood for his ancestral home, and he's just written a book about it called Downton Shabby. Check it out. got into Manchester train station. I got up at 5.30 in the morning, got on a 6.30 train, two hours up to Manchester, and now we're gonna hop in a taxi, and it'll be about another 40 minutes uh, to our destination, which is Hopwood Hall. And that's where Joel Lawrence, our photographer, has already arrived. He's filming with a drone, getting aerial shots. It's a tricky flight, because we only have a very small uh, area we can fly within. Tricky to get all the different angles. Hi! Hello! <laughs> I'm Molly. Hi, Hopwood. Nice to meet you. What a place! Welcome to Hopwood Hall. I see some broken windows. Yes. <laughs> Don't look at the broken ones. Just look at the fixed ones. We have hundreds and hundreds of broken windows. Hopwood takes us on a tour of Hopwood Hall, the place he has dubbed Downton Shabby. So this is the morning room Hoppet was just telling us. This is where the family would have come for breakfast, for coffee, for papers. Woof, careful. You can see all the original floorboards have been torn up. It's a little bit dangerous to walk around. That's why we're wearing the hard hats so nothing falls on. Let's keep going. Now I'm gonna take you into the oldest room in the house, 1420. Oh, look at that woodwork. Let's look at how much time and energy would have gone into this. Each individual. Each individual piece wow. and the little flowers and all the little leaves and everything. The little, this was to make this room special. To what was once one of the more spectacular rooms in the house. So this would be, this is the long gallery corridor. This is what would have welcomed guests. It was meant to be impressive and have high ceilings and very ornate ceilings. And with Joel leading the way, we even discover portions of the house Hopwood hasn't set foot in. 
I don't even know what's in here. <laughs> I've never even been in this. I don't even know what this is. You've never been in I, here? I've never been, I've never even seen this before. The next hurdle, a doorknob. <laughs> Yeah, this is how we get around here. We gotta, okay. Yep. There Perfect. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll leave this one open. <laughs> and on our way to another surprise. We pulled this wood out and realized that there was a groove in here. And then we there's realized there's a little keyhole. Oh. We realized this is a secret passageway. To where? It's locked though. <laughs> I think this is where the gold is hidden. <laughs> is that gold? <laughs> We never found gold, but despite that, back in the garden, Hopwood explains why he's committed to saving this house. I thought, if somebody calls me in five or ten years and says, Hopwood Hall was lost, it's gone, how would I feel? And I thought, I, I would feel terrible. So that's what inspired and me to get nine involved. Nine years later. And nine years later, here I am. Here you still are. trying to clean up dry rot. <laughs> <laughs> Hopwood told Molly he hopes in about three to five years this could be a cultural center or host big events. Mm -hmm. I think three to five years might be a little generous. <laughs> we'll see. Thanks yeah. so much for that, Molly. <laughs> well, up next, we're going to answer some questions from you, our viewers. We'll be right back. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back. We do this show for our viewers, so we want to take some time to answer some of the questions from our Plaza fans. <laughs> I want to know what's the number one thing left on your bucket list. What's yours? My goodness, there are some people I would still like to interview. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to have dinner. Can I just have dinner with Oprah and Beyonce? Okay. And interview them while we do it? Yeah, okay. well, that's a small order. What about you? To have a, an entire family reunion. We've never Ooh. had a family, a Roker family reunion. So oh, really? I'd like to do that. I know you work a lot of long and early hours, so what's your favorite thing to do to unwind? Um, do nothing. I'll take the Calm app, close my eyes, and just relax. You know, we've got a pontoon boat mm. uh, on a lake, and I love to just kind of get out there, drop the anchor, crack open a box of rosé, and call it a day. Sounds like a plan. You're gearing up for the City Concert Series this summer, and I'm curious, what's your favorite concert you've ever been to? Ooh. For me, it's, I don't know if it's a surprise, but Beyonce, I've gone a few times. I love a it. Few I just times. think she's such a great entertainer. Like, you leave inspired and ready to conquer the world. I remember at 13, I went to go see Little Stevie Wonder <laughs> at the Apollo, and he was performing with Sam and Dave. Wow. And I've, I've seen a lot of great concerts since then. Uh, that, and it was tied with my other uh, concert that I saw the same year, uh, Soupy Sales. Soupy who, Sales. You know, hey, Stevie do the Wonder. mouth, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a broad. broad it's a lot going on yeah, in there. Yeah, a lot happening. <laughs> well, I hope you had a good time, and we want to thank you for joining us, and hope you'll come back. But until next time, we'll see you then. Bye bye.
day all day up next on Hashtag Cooking. Samadada <laughs> is saying bye-bye to boring avocado toast with two of her favorite avocado-packed recipes. Then she'll banish sad desk lunches forever with a savory turmeric oatmeal and crispy cauliflower popper. Hey guys, it's Sama. I am so excited to share two of my favorite recipes with you today. They both use an avocado and they're both for my new cookbook. So let's get hashtag cooking. First up, we're gonna make my avocado cream pasta and then next for dessert, because we always have to have it, my avocado brownies. And yes, I did say brownies. This avocado cream pasta is literally one of my most popular recipes on my blog and I honestly think it's because you just need a blender to make this super luxurious sauce. I'm just gonna slice these tomatoes in half. You can totally leave them whole to roast them if you'd like, but I'm just gonna slice them so that we can get that nice caramelization around the edges. Now I'm just gonna arrange them onto my baking sheet. I've lined this with parchment paper. These rogue ones wanna be left behind, but they won't be. Now I'm just gonna drizzle with a little bit of olive oil and season with some salt and pepper and red pepper flakes. Olive oil, some red pepper flakes, a little salt and then some pepper. We don't want to roast these tomatoes for too long, only about 10 to 15 minutes. If you do roast them for too long, it will dry out those juices, and we definitely don't want that. We want a juicy tomato. Okay, looking pretty good. Now that my tomatoes are done, I'm just gonna leave them here to hang out while I prepare my pasta. All right, very important. Please promise me you won't forget to salt your pasta water, okay? Just promise me. I'm gonna salt it, and now I'm gonna add my pasta. Straight in there. And while this pasta is cooking, I bet that I can make the sauce in the time it takes for it to be done. All you need is a blender to make this super creamy sauce. So if you've ever made a smoothie and you have a blender at home, you can make this pasta sauce. So, the base of it is our avocados. I'm using an avocado and a half for this recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with that. Just slicing my avocados, making sure I also don't slice my finger in there. All right, we're gonna scoop some of this avocado out. Look at how ripe and pretty that is. Go straight in there. I'm gonna pit this. This avocado is what's gonna add that super creamy element to this pasta. Now I'm gonna move on to my lemon, adding the juice of one full lemon in here. Make sure I catch all the seeds. This lemon is gonna really make it tart and acidic and bring out that zing, make it very bright and fresh. I'm gonna add some fresh basil and raw garlic. Yes, I'm using raw. It's gonna be really punchy and really bright. And I love garlic. There we go. A Little bit of olive oil. Just a bit. And now I'm gonna season it to taste with some salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Salt in there. Add as much chili flakes as you'd like. I love spice, so I'm going in with a lot. But you make your own choices, okay? Now, just to help everything get moving in the blender, we're gonna add a little bit of cold water. Make sure it's cold because we don't wanna brown the avocado. Just a bit, and I can add more and adjust to get it to the right consistency that I like. Now it's time to blend. Perfect. It is so luxe, you will not even believe it. Look at that. So creamy. Did you see that? I made that pasta sauce and my pasta is done. Super quick. We love a blender recipe. Now I'm just gonna spoon my pasta out. Before I add this creamy sauce to my pasta, I'm gonna grab one more thing. Just grab some arugula from the fridge. I love adding this to this pasta because it gives this really nice peppery bite to it. All right, time to assemble. Got my sauce, gonna add this into my pasta. You might think you put cream in this, but you didn't, I promise. I'm just gonna really stir that in. I'm gonna add my tomatoes. Just a little burst of something sweet in with this avocado cream sauce. Now I'm just gonna mix in my arugula. 
What's great about this pasta as well is that you can eat it immediately, but you can also refrigerate it to have as a pasta salad the next day. We love a leftover. We love a meal prep situation. This is both of these. All right, time for me to plate this for myself. Is that too much? There's never too much. <laughs> what is a portion? <laughs> I have my tomatoes that I reserved just for this moment. Place them on top. Make it look really nice, a little pop of color. And now, some freshly ground black pepper and a pinch of flaky sea salt. And that is it. But one last thing. I can't forget to take a photo. I didn't do all of this for nothing. I love this. I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna put this on my wall. I think it's fair to say that it's time for me to eat. Okay, here I go. Gotta get some arugula, some pasta in there. Okay. Mmm. I love myself. <laughs> It's so creamy, you honestly would never know that there's no cream or butter in this. It's crazy. It feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We are so used to thinking of using avocado in savory recipes, but plot twist, they're amazing in sweet recipes too, especially when chocolate is involved. And that is where my avocado brownies come in. I've already preheated my oven to 350 degrees and now I'm gonna prepare my pan. I love parchment paper, I live for parchment paper. I've already greased my pan here with some coconut oil and now I've created a little strip of paper that I can just lay in to my pan stick it down because the coconut oil really helps it stick. And then I've created these nice little flaps which are gonna make it super easy to remove the brownies from the pan when they're done baking. I've got great news. For you and for these brownies, everything comes together in a blender. Like you could make a smoothie, but don't. Make these brownies instead. All right. We're starting with my avocado, star of my show. Gonna slice this in half. Great way to use avocados when you're sick of the guacamole, when you're sick of all the savory things that you've been making with it. What's really nice about using an avocado in this brownie recipe is that it's super creamy and rich, so it actually serves as a really nice butter replacement and you cannot even taste it. I promise. All right, avocado is in. Time for the rest of my ingredients. I'm using two eggs here. And Park that straight in there. And now I'm gonna add some creamy peanut butter. You can definitely use an almond butter if you'd like, but I love peanut butter. 
So we're starting with all of our wet ingredients first. Gonna sweeten this up with some maple syrup and some coconut sugar as well. And then a little bit of vanilla extract. So now I'm just gonna blend everything together here and then get to work on my dry ingredients later. I'm using an almond flour for this recipe because I think it's really nice and dense and cakey, which is gonna be really delicious with these brownies. Add my almond flour in there. Now, we're gonna use a cocoa powder. Make sure you get an unsweetened cocoa or a cacao powder. We want it to be really pure here with nothing added because we've already sweetened it with some coconut sugar and maple. Oh! Now some baking soda. Isn't it so convenient? Like, just a blender and brownies are the result? Sign me up. A little bit of salt. This is gonna be really nice to bring out that sweetness and also balance out that chocolate. And now, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna blend. You may need to scrape down the size of the blender to get it there, but just be patient with yourself and your blender. All right, we're looking really good. Now I like a little bit of a sweeter brownie, so I'm gonna fold in some chocolate chips. You don't have to do this if you don't want, but if you like joy and happiness, I would highly recommend it. I'm gonna reserve a few chips on top before baking so we can just get that nice aesthetic before it goes into the oven. You know how I operate. I'm gonna fold this in. How easy was this? Can we take a moment to address how easy this is? And now all I'm gonna do is transfer it into my pan, which I've prepared already. Look at that. You would never know there was an avocado in here. We put a whole fruit in these brownies and you can't even taste it, I promise. I smooth the batter out in the pan. Make sure it's evenly distributed. That looks pretty good. And now for my chocolate chips. Gonna add them on top. Less is not more here. That's my philosophy when it comes to chocolate. Less is just not more. In fact, more is more. All right, so now we're ready for the oven. and they are done. You can tell that the brownies are done when they start to pull away from the sides of the pan a little bit and a knife inserted in the center comes out clean. I'm so excited about this. And again, I love parchment paper. This is so easy. I'm just gonna lift them straight out of the pan like this. Pretty good form, huh? I'm gonna slice these, big piece for myself. I'm gonna top it with some ice cream and peanut butter because I love myself and I deserve this. It's such a clean cut too. Who needs a gym, <laughs> right? I, wanna, I need a bigger scoop. <laughs> All right. And now I'm just gonna top it with a little peanut butter drizzle. I just melted this in the microwave for a little bit so it gets nice and melty and easier to drizzle. I think this looks perfect. Pretty good. Now, last step. Just gonna top it with a little bit of flaky sea salt. Partially for taste, partially for aesthetics. I just have to take a picture of this. I need to document it. It looks too good not to. Okay. That little drip right there? Is that a joke? Okay, now I need to try this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm gonna just leave. <laughs> it's so crazy, there's no butter or oil in these brownies, but they taste so decadent and rich. Who gave me permission to do this? Avocado really came through today.
cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Lunch is sort of that lost meal in between breakfast and dinner where you don't really know what quite to do with yourself. So, in order to make your lunch exciting, I'm going to hashtag end sad desk lunches and show you two of my favorites. First up, I'm going to show you how to make some delicious spiced breaded cauliflower poppers and my favorite savory oatmeal with caramelized onions. To be honest, cauliflower is truly in everything these days. We see it in pizza, we see it in pasta, it's probably in ice cream, I don't want to know about it. But the best way to use cauliflower is in these cauliflower poppers because you know what? They can literally do it all. They're a great snack, a great appetizer, and a yummy lunch, especially when paired with a delicious salad. The key to the cauliflower poppers, it's in the almond meal. Make sure you're buying the one with the skin still on the almonds. I find this adheres a lot better to the cauliflower, making it really nice and crispy. I want this breading to be super flavorful on its own. I don't want it to just act as a sidekick, so I'm gonna add some spices. I'm gonna add my almond meal straight into my bowl. And then I'm adding my favorite spices, some cayenne, some cumin, and some turmeric. Finally, we're gonna add a little pinch of salt. Now, time to just whisk everything together. The turmeric's gonna give it a really nice color as well. It's gonna be really nice and yellow and pretty. It's gonna make this cauliflower glamorous. Make sure it's really well incorporated. All right, this looks really nice. Now I'm gonna whisk up some eggs. I'm using two eggs here. We need something for the breading to stick to, so that's why we're gonna make this little egg bath situation. Perfect. Whisk that up. Okay, this looks pretty good. And this is my favorite part, we get to assemble. So I have half a head of cauliflower cut up into florets, and now I get to just assemble. Using my tongs, my favorite kitchen tool. Gonna stick this straight into the eggs. Roll that around nicely. You want it to be fully coated. Let any of that excess egg just drip off. We want a nice even coating, so that's why we're doing this. And then it's gonna go straight into our almond meal mixture. Let the breading really coat the cauliflower well. We want it all over the cauliflower into all the little nooks and crannies. 
And now, just gonna transfer straight to our parchment lined pan. See how easy that was? That's crazy, that was so easy. We can all do this. And now I'm just gonna repeat with all of the other cauliflower florets. Make sure you're shaking that excess almond meal off as well. We want a nice, even coating. Pop that straight on the sheet. These are sort of like cauliflower wings. So if you're plant-based, if you're vegetarian, even if you're not, it's kind of a fun and new way to get a veggie in your life. You can also totally use your hands for this. I'm being very neat and clean today. I don't want to crowd anyone on my pan here, so this is going to be my first batch. I am so excited for these to get into the oven. I'm going to bake them at 350 for about 30 minutes until they're nice and golden and crispy. Well, they're ready. Just FYI, I did flip them once halfway through baking so we can get that nice and even crispness on both sides. I really like to pair this with a variety of sauces. I like to have a sauce flight, a lot of choices here. You can really use whatever you'd like, whatever sauce suits your mood. It's also really great if you want to eat it solo. I mean, this is what I do at home, so I actually eat them straight off the pan. It's the fact. It just is this really gorgeous almond crusted exterior. Oh, it's so good. There is really nothing this cauliflower cannot do. I'll stand by that forever. Oh, I have to take a picture. I mean, come on. They're begging to be dipped and snacked on. I'm going in. So good. Mmm. That masala on the breading, it's spicy, it's flavorful. And I'm like eating a vegetable. Like, what? You never know. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. When you think of oatmeal, you're probably thinking, wow, that's such a breakfast move. But I have to disagree because oats are actually the perfect base for anything savory and grounding and delicious. I'm gonna show you how to make my really hearty, savory turmeric oatmeal with caramelized onions, avocado, an egg, and peppery arugula. It is so good. So let's get started. The first thing I wanna do is caramelize my onions because that's gonna take the most amount of time. So I'm just gonna dice them up right now. If I cry, it's not because of the onions. It's because I'm really excited to make this, just so we're clear. I'm just gonna heat some olive oil in my pan and start on this caramelization. Adding some olive oil. Now that the oil is shimmering, I'm gonna go ahead and add my onions. Hot. 
Caramelizing the onions is gonna create this really nice full-bodied flavor. It's also gonna add a little sweetness. So oats themselves don't really have a lot of flavor. So by adding all of these different elements, we're really gonna create our own flavor profile here. We're gonna let these caramelize for about 15 to 20 minutes so it gets a really nice deep golden color and then we're gonna get to work on our oatmeal. What's really great about caramelized onions is that you can make them in a huge batch, freeze them so you'll always have some on hand. I'm gonna let these hang out, get really delicious and caramelized and I'm gonna go grab some of my greens. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes. Can you even believe these onions? They look so good. They smell even better, if you can believe it. And now I'm just gonna upgrade them a bit with some of my favorite spices. I'm gonna add my cumin straight in here. And then my turmeric. And I really just wanna toast the spices in with the caramelized onions so they become nice and fragrant and any of that raw spice smell goes away. And finally, can't forget them, my salt and pepper. I'm gonna just roast these for a few minutes until they smell really fragrant and aromatic. And then we're gonna move on to my oats. Now it's time to cook my oats. I'm actually going to be using vegetable broth to cook them in. You can totally use water if you'd like, but I find that veggie broth makes it a lot more flavorful. I'm using rolled oats here, just by the way. Give it a little stir, bring it to a boil, and let the oats absorb all of that liquid. We're boiling. Make sure you stir the oats while you cook them. It's a really aggressive boil. The liquid is reducing, the oats are thickening up. I'm gonna reduce the heat. Now, because you have so many savory and grounding flavors here, I want something a bit fresh, a little peppery bite, and that is where my arugula comes in. I'm just gonna stir in a handful here. You can choose however much you wanna add. I like a lot of arugula, so I'm gonna kinda go for it. You just want it to wilt, and then we're gonna take it off the heat. Now, it is time for my caramelized onions. You thought I forgot about them. How could I ever forget about them? Gonna add them straight into my oatmeal. Give that a nice stir so everyone becomes friends. Now I'm just gonna remove it from the heat and add all of my toppings. Okay, now I'm just gonna transfer my oatmeal to my bowl. Can't leave any oats behind, that'd be so rude. I mean this color though. Gotta give some props to my turmeric. Really making that magic happen. I'm adding a few things here. I like having a lot of textural elements here, so I'm gonna add some creamy avocado. It's gonna contrast those oats really nicely. I'm gonna add an egg, soft boiled egg, and maybe some more greens. We'll see how I'm feeling. I'm just gonna slice my avocado. First, I wanna just take a moment. Okay. These are kind of fat slices. I will say I didn't intend to make them this, like, chunky, but you know what? I'm just lunching at home. This is real life. The avocado doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm gonna add my egg. I'm using a soft boiled egg here. I mean, I, do I need to say anything? I'm just not. I'm gonna let that speak for itself. A little salt. All right. A little pep. And finally, to finish it all off, some herbs. I'm using some cilantro here, but if cilantro freaks you out, you don't like it, I know it scares a lot of people, and that's okay. Like, that's totally fine. Use parsley, omit it, whatever you wanna do. I'm not gonna judge you. This looks like a pretty fat blunch. She's stunning. Um, you know who's gonna be jealous? Basically all of my friends. So I'm gonna have to send a picture to them, show them how cute my lunch is. Maybe it'll inspire them to make their own cute lunch. Okay, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to taste it. I wanna make sure I get a little bit of everything. Some of those oats, the onions, the avocado, the egg. Mmm. I wanna congratulate us all because we can now say goodbye to sad desk lunches forever.
Hello and welcome to Wellness Today. I'm Chanel Jones and we are bringing you some important wellness news to kick off the start of summer. We'll share details about recent medical studies with tips on how you and your family can stay healthy. Then learn to strengthen every step with a few easy exercises that will transform your daily walk. Plus, we'll learn why it matters to have an LGBTQ friendly medical provider. And I tried a popular form of relaxation for the first time. It is everything you need to know to take care of your physical and mental wellness this month. Research publishes every day, but what does that mean for you and your family? Joining us to explain everything from extreme heat risk to camp safety is NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar. She's here to break down the details of these medical studies and how they impact our day-to-day -day life. I'm so happy we're doing this. Quite often we hear about studies, but then we don't hear the details behind them. And That's these true. are really good ones. Yeah. So let's start with the first one. Um, it's associated with extreme heat um, and what it does for mortality rates. Right, I know. So. The, the extreme heat has been increasing now for a number of years. In okay. fact, many, many states in this country are experiencing days that are over 90 degrees, many of them, more than before. We have basically, you think, usually we have a summer season of heat, it's starting earlier, and it's lasting later. And this is really significant. So this was a research um, out of Penn okay. that actually looked at this kind of stuff. And the things that we want to talk to people about here are the signs of heat stroke and what you can do about them. So it's important, Chanel, right? I think most people have a misconception that uh, if you are having a heat stroke that your skin is going to be very wet because it's you're sweating a lot. Yes. Um, and that's actually not true. Your, really? your skin actually becomes very dry, very huh. red, uh, and very, very hot. You know, the number one symptom of a heat stroke is a core temperature of 104 degrees or more. But guess what? Most of us don't have a digital you know. thermometer. Yeah. Right, exactly. Right, so right. Um, obviously fainting, feeling dizzy, things like that and having that that dry skin are signs and symptoms of a heat stroke okay so what do you do for a heat stroke the number one thing and I really want viewers to understand this is to call 911 first okay. because if you suspect a heat stroke you need to get that person medical attention quickly I think people underestimate the severity of it I exactly think they, they can just you know cool down and it'll yeah. be okay but you you, you don't want to yeah. do that always err on the side of caution and then you move the person into a cool shaded area remove as much clothes as you can and then a little trick that I think is so so helpful let's say you're at a picnic and you have ice packs okay right? you put them under the neck put them in the groin and under the arms a lot of blood vessels there wait and under the way, neck under the arm, under the arms, and, and, and in the, the groin, groin. Okay. and there's a lot of blood vessels in those areas, and that can help people cool down. You're not supposed to put people in an ice bath. Which That's people do? They do. The only people who can really do that are people who are like athletes, athletes. who just did a vigorous, you know, um, okay. a run or something like that, and they can handle it. But most people should not be put in an ice okay. bath. Those are the kind of things we'll, we'll always remember. That now I know I will. All right. So moving on to yeah. another study that grabbed our attention: summer camp safety. A lot of parents, obviously, preparing to send their kids to summer camp. I know I am. We all want our kids to have fun, but we also want to make sure they're safe. Yes. What does the research say? So this was a study out of the University of Michigan, and they polled parents. And you're gonna you're gonna be a little bit surprised by these statistics. Okay. Less than 50% of parents who were polled said that camp safety was a priority for them. Mm. And only one in 10, 10% said COVID precautions were important. You wanna know wow. what the most important things were? What? Cost, location, mm. and activity. So it's kind of like, oh, where are your priorities, mm. guys? But I get it, right? We've yeah. all sent our kids to camp. There's a lot of things to take into consideration. One of the things that um, I think is really important uh, to understand is that camps will say whether or not they're accredited by the American Camp Association. Association. But you want to follow that up and confirm that they really are. And a really great resource is the American Academy of Pediatrics website. It's called healthychildren.org. Okay. They have numerous resources about camp and camp safety. Like, you know, think of your it's kids, not. right? Like my daughter has migraines. Is the camp equipped to handle that? Are they mm. equipped to handle the mental health needs of your children? These are all things you want to know, right? You're it's entrusting. True. Especially the, if it's a sleepaway especially camp. Especially if it's yeah. a sleepaway camp. Yeah. So a lot of good that's information good. out there for, okay, for parents. Good. All right, the third study team sports and mental health yeah. uh, speaking of summer activities it looks at the connection between team sports and mental health in our kids yes. this is a hot topic a right hot now. topic on so many levels yeah. so this was a study again this was from Cal State they looked at kids between the ages of 9 and 13 and they found that the children who participated in a team sport had better mental health 
um, you know, parameters, let's say, in terms of anxiety, depression, and stuff like that, okay. as opposed to kids who either were not in sports or who were participating in, you know, an independent kind of sport. Okay. Um, but I think immediately we might say, okay, that's important, team sports are important, but what about all these news things that we're That's hearing. what I was thinking. I'll be honest. Exactly. I mean, it seems like we're hearing about the pressure, especially for right. college athletes or, right. you know. So when does good cross over and become not so healthy? So, you know, it's kind of like a little bit of that Goldilocks, right? Mm. Not enough isn't good, but maybe too much isn't good either. Um, and experts say that for sure the college athlete has a tremendous amount of pressure and stress, right? They're managing school and travel, um, and they have to keep up their scholastic mm. and their athletic performance. So they have some unique challenges, but I think this is a lesson for all of us and Chanel I know you have yeah. kids who are teens as well a lot of pressure for these kids to perform yeah. athletically we need to be paying attention to their mental health too and not mm. just to assume they're that they're okay they're with okay. all the stress that we're putting on them that's so important yeah. okay another important story uh, the study that grabbed our attention speaking of kids that it talks about the dangers of inappropriate antibiotic use yes. with kids we've heard that sometimes we overuse them we call the doctor and we say can you get me an antibiotic yes. for my kids right 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 so there's a, a few different things that that are concerning about overuse of antibiotics. One, of course, is antibiotic resistance, mm -hmm. right? We know that's a big thing. Um, expenditures, you're going to the doctor, you're missing school, you're, you're, you're missing work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of dollars that go into this that, that are unnecessary. And also, people have side effects yeah. from, from taking antibiotics. There are actually numerous ones. And probably one of the biggest things that I find that is a problem is that kids are getting antibiotics, maybe for, maybe for a virus, and they never yeah. needed it in the first place. And guess what? They get a rash. And and then they live their entire life saying, I have a, a rash to penicillin that sticks with them through their adult lives. That's a big, big problem. The take home, I think, for parents here is that you need to advocate for your children um, and not, you know, not to discount the importance and the role of the pediatrician in, in making a diagnosis and treating appropriately, but you as the parent need to say, just want to make sure my kid really needs this antibiotic, right? Mm. Um, so it's a two-way street. It's not always the parents saying we want it. Sometimes no. do the doctors just prescribe it? Exactly. Okay. And you have to advocate for the kids, right? Because okay. they're young and they, and they can't do it themselves. Another good one, a survey that finds that most men think they are healthier than others. Yeah. And let's talk about those annual health screenings. Father's Day is coming up. Right. It's so important. Right. So this is a Harris poll. I love these stats. So 33% of men polled say that they don't need to go to the doctor every year. 33%? We'll 33%. 65% said that they were they thought they were healthier than like the average guy next to them. 38% um, get their health information on social media. And 38% put their pets' needs, pets' health before theirs. Wow. Aren't those interesting numbers? We have some work to do. I but know. yet I believe it. I know. Oh, sure. But here's the thing. So do you actually have to see the doctor every year? Believe it or not, the literature is a little bit mixed on that Ooh. as to whether or not seeing your doctor every single year is necessary. I would say in middle age, it becomes much more necessary. Sure. You do want to establish that relationship. It's always easier to take care of someone when they're sick, when you know when the, when, when you know them when they are healthy. You're so good. You're so lovely. Dr. Azar, <laughs> now she has to actually go help her patients. I'm going to go see my patients Yes, now. so thank you. Good information, <laughs> for sure. Thank you. All right, coming up, the exercises to help you take everything every moment in stride. And later, I'm hooked, I loved it, I tried a sound bath for the very first time. We're gonna tell you all about it, all that and more just ahead on Wellness Today. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
Allie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're back with Wellness Today, wellness news you can use. It is walking month here at the Today Show. Research suggests that there are endless physical and mental health benefits to taking a walk, from lowering your resting heart rate to feeling more energized. Our dear friend Al Roker even walked his way to the finish line of the Brooklyn Half Marathon. Now, fitness expert Stephanie Mansour is going to help you put your best foot forward with a few strength exercises. Thanks, Janelle. I'm Stephanie Mansour, and I'm so excited that you've joined us during our month-long walking challenge. I want to show you a few exercises that'll help you build strength and avoid injuries as you take more and more steps each day. First, we're going to start with a squat. Start with your feet as wide as your hips. We're gonna pull the abs in and sit back as if you're about to sit back into a chair. Now I'm gonna show you this from the side, but I want you to make sure that when you're looking down at your toes, your knees do not go past your toes. That's a common mistake. So we wanna keep the knees back, lead with the glutes, sink the tailbone down, pull the abs in to support the low back, press down through the heels to stand up. Next, we're gonna move on to our marching bridge. So we're gonna lie down on our backs and come into a bridge position. Now this works the hamstrings and the glutes, which are important for helping you walk more efficiently and effectively. So in this position with the feet close to the hands, we're gonna slowly lift the hips up, the lower back comes off the ground and the middle back. You wanna make sure to pull your belly button in towards your spine like someone's touching you with a sharp object and you're trying to pull that navel in because this is going to help us with stability in the core and also make sure that we're not dumping and putting pressure on the low back. You only have to lift up about an inch or two or if you're more advanced, you can lift up higher. Pull your abs in and keep your hip bones steady rather than shaking from side to side as you do this move. We need to really keep it stable and in control. Next, we're gonna move into a plank and then a downward facing dog. So coming into a plank position, we're gonna start on our hands and knees and line the shoulders up over the wrists. From here, we're gonna tuck the toes under and lift the hips up into a plank position. Pull the abs in and reach the heels towards the back of the room. Make sure that your back is in a straight line. For a modification, you can lower down onto your knees. Then from the plank position, we're gonna pull the abs in and lift up and back into a downward facing dog. Press down through the hands and externally rotate the shoulders as you reach the hips up and reach the heels towards the ground. Now for a modification here, you can open the hands a little wider, fan the fingers out and open the feet wider and bend the knees. If you wanna do the full modification, you'll go from the half plank right here and then you'll tuck the toes under, lift the hips up and press back with the hands open wide, the knees bent and the tailbone reaching up towards the ceiling. Not only are we building that core strength, but we're also building that flexibility in the backs of the legs. Now next we're gonna do a seated oblique twist and that's gonna help us with the internal and external obliques, which are great when we're walking and pumping those arms. So sitting up nice and tall, hands behind your knees, Take a deep breath in and then exhale, pull the abs in and roll down just slightly. Have the hands at the center of your chest and then twist to one side, back through center, twist to the other, back through center. For an added bonus, you can squeeze those inner thighs together to really work your entire core. Next, we're gonna stand up and move into one of my favorite exercises, which is a knee raise into a backwards leg lift. So we're working on hip flexor mobility here. So if you're looking to take longer strides or if you're looking to walk faster, building that strength and the mobility is key to helping your walk feel better. So hands on the hips, we're gonna lift one knee up at about a 90 degree angle and then slowly shift your weight forward and extend that leg back into a backwards leg lift. Slowly balance, if you need to, you can touch your toe on the ground. Come up with that knee, 90 degree angle. Pull the abs in, slowly lean forward, reach the leg back, engage the glute and the hamstring. One more on this side, abs in tight to help guide you. Good, and exhale and come to center. And then finally, to round this strength training workout out, we're going to go into calf raises. So standing with your feet as wide as your hips again, hands on your hips, we're gonna lift up onto the tiptoes and lower down. 
up onto the tiptoes and lower down. We're strengthening the backs of the legs. So in doing this multifunctional workout routine, we're helping you build lower body and core strength so that you can walk and feel like you're moving more freely. And also this is gonna enhance your walk and enhance the strength in your entire body. Thanks, Stephanie. It's never too late to get moving. Join the Start Today community on Facebook and follow along throughout the rest of the month to find inspiration and motivation to get walking. All right, coming up, celebrating Pride Month at the doctor's office and later the instruments and melodies that help me find a new level of relaxation right after this. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think my job is to think about what you tell me now tonight with joshua johnson streaming weeknights at eight on nbc news now now tonight with joshua johnson streaming weeknights at eight on nbc news now Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. June is Pride Month, and all month long we're honoring the LGBTQ community. It can be challenging for anyone to find a physician that understands your unique needs, but especially for LGBTQ people. So for that reason, we've invited two experts to talk about best practices for finding a friendly provider for both physical and mental needs. We have Dr. Barbara Warren, uh, the director, the senior director of LGBTQ programs and policies at Mount Sinai Health Systems Office for Diversity and Inclusion, and and Dr. Ming Hao Lu is the director of the Freedman Transgender Program at Lenox Hill Hospital, Northwell Health. Good morning to both of you. Or thank morning. you guys. I'm so used to saying good morning on the mm -hmm. Today Show. This could be any time of the day. <laughs> I think it's so important to set this up about maybe for both of you, the biggest challenges facing the LGBTQ community, because I think sometimes if you're not walking in someone's mm -hmm. shoes, you don't even recognize that it is a challenge mm -hmm. in the first place. So can you put this in perspective for other people as to why this is so important mm -hmm. to discuss? Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges is even getting access to a knowledgeable and sensitive pr provider. Um, we often say that prevention is the best medicine, and if people are not getting access to care, then people in the community are not getting screened for conditions that can be more prevalent, um, such as heart disease, STDs, including HIV, and certain types of cancers. Um, in addition, I think another major challenge facing the community is mental health and also intimate par partner violence. I didn't even think about that part of it too. Mm -hmm. So again, you have the physical part of it and you also mm -hmm. have the, the mental health aspect. What would you say about why this think, is so important? I think to follow up on uh, the idea of prevention and uh, getting uh, routine health care, particularly good primary care, so that it doesn't end up being a, an acute or a crisis in your health. I think one of the things that we really emphasize at Mount Sinai in training our, our providers 
and also is a huge issue in the LGBT community is the concept and the impact of minority stress. Mm. And minority stress is any kind of stress related to being a marginalized or ta targeted minority at, as many LGBTQ people still are. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for LGBTQ patients and people to understand that even if they have access to great affirmative care um, and in our pretty good health, the accumulated stress or the secondary stress of worrying about uh, or anticipating discrimination, mm. prejudice, violence, some of the anti-LGBTQ sentiments and laws that are being passed now increases your risk factor for many, many diseases because what happens is when you get stressed, your heart rate increases, you um, have cortisol that's sustained over time and as, as we know as healthcare providers that can lead to all kinds of chronic health conditions. So it's really important to be aware of that and it's important for your providers to be aware of that, mm -hmm. particularly when they're doing preventative and wellness care for it. It makes a lot of sense. If you can't walk into a physician's office and talk to that physician and be your full self right. and be honest about your life, your lifestyle, all those things, that physician can't treat you, you know, effectively. Right. So with that said, Dr. Lou, let's break it down. How should someone go about finding um, an LGBTQ friendly provider? That's a great question. So one can do a basic search on Google, um, find providers and research more about their, the providers and the services they offer. Sites like ZocDoc also offer um, for people to search on their directory specifically mm -hmm. for LGBTQ plus friendly providers. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, GLMA, which used to be known as the Gay Lesbian Medical Association, also has a free nationwide provider search tool um, for LGBTQ plus friendly providers. Um, but really what my patients have found to be perhaps even more helpful is that um, they go through social media channels such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and sometimes Reddit, mm -hmm. and they get referrals from other people in the community who've actually seen these doctors or other healthcare providers and been very pleased with the experience. So then let's take the next step then. Once you find a provider, how can you ensure that that person is a good fit for you? Well, one of the things I think that's important is to check out the website of the organization or the healthcare system that provider works for. Okay. If they don't uh, have an LGBT specific page or referral service or information or they don't advertise themselves, for example, as a, an LGBT health equality leader, many, many healthcare systems now ascribe to the LGBT Healthcare Equality Index, which is a national benchmarking survey conducted by uh, the Human Rights Campaign Foundation, which really helps hospitals and healthcare providers put all the things into place that make LGBT healthcare uh, affirmative and effective in their um, hospitals. Also, if so, to look it up, find out are they an LGBTQ healthcare equality leader? Do they have an LGBTQ healthcare website? Um, also, when you get to the office, to look around before you even meet whoever the provider is going to be. Mm -hmm. Are you asked for your sexual orientation and gender identity, your partner status mm -hmm. uh, on your intake forms? Is there LGBT uh, visual things in the, in the office? Do they have pride flags? Do they have the advocate, the national LGBTQ magazine is part of their magazines on display? Do they have pamphlets? All of these are signals that this is an environment that knows that LGBT people come to them. They want it to be visible. They want it to be welcoming. Um, and so those are all clues too. Um, but I agree with Dr. Liu, uh, referrals uh, from knowledgeable providers and also uh, friends in the community can be really, really powerful and important. That's so helpful. And you know, we talk about it a lot in the bigger cities, but in some of the rural areas too. I mean, you know, this is obviously people watching all over the country. Mm -hmm. It's important to try to have those resources. Thank you guys mm -hmm. both so much um, for coming in, Dr. Warren and Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. All right, when we come back, the transformative relaxation experience that helped me find my inner peace. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Sometimes.
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to Wellness Today. I am so excited to debut a new segment in the show where I'm going to try some of the trends, classes, and activities that I'm most curious about within the wellness space. As the school year comes to a close and I'm shuffling my kids to their end of year activities, I wanted to see if I could find some inner zen with a sound bath. And it had a profound impact. Take a look. The melodies of the singing bowls and the vibrations of the gong echo through the halls of the Ohm Center on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where I tried a sound bath for the first time. So let's start with the basics. What is a sound bath? A sound bath is where you are experiencing the being bathed by all the sounds that are created from different kinds of instruments. The goal is to help you enter into a deep state of relaxation. Sound baths are a gateway into deeper meditation. Suzanne Hill, founder of the Ohm Center and my guide for the sound bath, began meditating on her own at 17 after years of working as an acupuncturist and encouraging her patients to try meditation, she began teaching herself and opened this space in 2019. What difference are you seeing in, in the people who you help? They are so much more relaxed. They seem much, much lighter, like the burdens of the world are lifted. Even if nothing has shifted in the external world internally, mm -hmm. they've cleansed and so they feel better. Since this story is about trying a sound bath, what should the takeaway be? for people who are interested. Not to be intimidated by it. It doesn't have to be a spiritual or religious experience. You're just having a relaxation experience. And before long, it was my time to try and rest. I am not quite sure what to expect. I'm gonna try, I don't wanna fall asleep, which I can do pretty easily these days, but also am looking forward to feeling something that I haven't felt before. You know, I've meditated before with calm, but I've never done a sound bath, so I, my heart is open to receive. I'm gonna have you lie down. Once I entered the room, Here, Suzanne handed down. me an eye mask and encouraged me to okay. let go of the worries down. of the day. And just allow yourself to sink into the ground. Be aware of the ground supporting your body so there's no part of you that has to hold yourself up. Then she began playing, creating a symphony of sounds. <laughs> Crystal bowls have a cooler sound and the uh, alloy bowls have a warmer sound and we like to mix them together. We also have a 40 inch symphonic gong, which is very grounding. When you play the gong, it's really about releasing any negativity. Singing bowls are more nurturing and nourishing. She transferred the bowls to my hands to feel the vibrations as she played. As the sound bath finished, I felt better, and that sense of calm reverberated through the rest of my day. That was really great. Yeah. That was great. It's like I was at a spa. Music and sound is very healing, and I think that's why people are gravitating to sound baths now. They don't want to intellectually figure out how to feel better. They just want to experience feeling better.
I don't think it was in my head. It's hard to explain, but I really did feel more calm and relaxed, even in the hours and even the couple of days after. After the sound bath, I let what usually bothers me running around and the hustle and bustle, I let it go. And I'm telling you, I'm really looking forward to going back and doing it again. So if there's one in your area, maybe you should try it. Find some ways, frankly, anyway, uh, to relax. And I'm glad I got to learn about this one. Thank you for joining me to learn all of the wellness news you can use. I hope you found it inspiring and motivating to learn about how to take care of ourselves and each other as we ease into the official start of summer. I'm Chanel Jones, and we'll see you next time on Wellness Today. Hello. Hi. Oh my gosh. Okay. Isn't this crazy all the way to the West Coast? Well, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Sitting across from you, I'm going to tell you right now, is a privilege and an honor. What it is saying, a woman? privilege and an honor. Okay. Um, one word that you would use to describe yourself. Ebullient. Ebullient. Why, why that word? Because it's my nature. I never used to be like this, but I, I, I have come to appreciate every little moment. Describe, describe, you said you weren't always like that. Describe who the little girl was. Oh, the little girl Rosita Dolores Alverio was fearful, um, felt very unworthy, felt without value. Hmm. Uh, not necessarily my mom's fault, it was the fault of the times that anybody who came from Puerto Rico was not a good person and I learned that very, very early and I learned it too well. How did you, what was the first time you learned that, that you remember? I think I was five when uh, my mom had brought me to America. We lived in New York City and uh, in, in the ghetto, Hispanic ghetto. And on the way to kindergarten, I noticed that the little gangs of white boys were just gathered there, it seems, to uh, tease and, and uh, make deeply unhappy little girls, mostly little girls, who pass by on the way to school and say bad names. And they were very scary. And you it, just it, tucked it away. Yeah. Tucked it away. And the trouble with tucking is that it sits there and festers. And you wonder why, why do I feel so bad about myself? Ah. So this little girl who had all these feelings had a spark in her. She loved to perform. Like, what was it about the experience of performing oh, that turned the lights on that's for That's easy you? to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, grandpa in Puerto Rico, Abuelo, used to uh, have me dance to records. Remember records? Of course. I used to love to boogie it all and shake my little tush. <laughs> And he would hug me and kiss me, and everybody in the family would say, isn't she adorable? And I thought, this is nice. I could do with more of this, truly. Did you like being Hispanic? Not for a long time. Once I came to America, yeah. I perceived that it was not a good thing to be Hispanic. And for years and years and years, I battled that. How, so how did you, did you try to hide it? I did tried you... very much to hide it. I tried to be very American. Mm -hmm. um, I tried to be up to date in things, whatever mm -hmm. that happened to be, whether it was fashion or little funny sayings that Americans would make up, you know. And you chose um, a career that would put you into the spotlight. So that would highlight Again, but I didn't who, know that. Ah, I didn't know that. Ah. All I knew was I want to be Elizabeth Taylor. That's what you thought? Yeah, we yeah. were the same age, more yeah. or less. Yeah. And she was beautiful yeah. beyond reason. I thought it was entirely possible. Mm -hmm. You know, until, until people tell you when you're young that it can't be, you believe it can. So you th you you wanted to be Elizabeth Taylor. You wanted to be on stage, on screen, and it started happening for you. But you, again, you know, you had a name that your agent thought was not going to work. <laughs> he, he was like, uh-uh, not this name. So the, the casting director at MGM, mm -hmm. where I was under contract, said, uh, Rosita Alverio? He said, no, no. He says, that's too Italian. Rosita Alverio, okay. So he said, we got to change your name. 
we finally settled. He said, who's your favorite actress at that time? And I said, <laughs> Rita Hayworth. He said, we'll call you Rita. And he said, that last name really sucks. I said, my stepfather's last name, Moreno. Uh. So that's what it became, Rita Moreno. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. So you were getting parts, and you were getting a lot of roles, but the roles seemed to have a common thread. Yeah. The thread was... Native girls. Yes. At first, it was great. Anything would be good. Sure. Anything. I'd be in a movie. Everything was new and yeah. thrilling and delightful. And I looked prettier than I'd ever looked because the makeup was perfect. Mm -hmm. And then more and more, I kept having to uh, learn how to do accents, and, and, and the makeup got darker and yeah. darker and darker, and all because of my name. And I began to see a pattern emerge, and it began to get make me very sad. And there was no way that I knew to make that turn around. Because it was Island American girl, Indian girls. Right. Island girls, a it, always immoral. illiterate. They didn't know how to speak. They had yeah. to have accents that nobody even taught me. And so I, they would all sound like these. Even if they were Egyptian, they would sound Puerto Rican. <laughs> what did that do when you were cast in those roles and you realized this is the box I'm in? This yeah. is the box I'm in. Right. What did it do to your soul, your self-esteem? Uh, it was really seriously at risk. And as I began to see that the girls I always had to play were Ill always illiterate. Uh, they always had accents. They always had dark skin. But you know, I was so naive. Mm -hmm. I was really, I was that little Bronx girl mm -hmm. that said, they said, you know, you want to sit in the mud here and, you know, put it on your face. Okay. okay. Whatever you ask. I don't to like do. the way it feels, but okay. It sounds like that thread of just saying, okay. Yeah happened in your career as well when it was, um, you know, sexual harassment obviously was rampant in Hollywood. Oh. But when you're young and naive and just all you want to do is be accepted, right. you were like the, the, the perfect prey for some of these men. I had a studio head. I was like 21 or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, he took one look at me and he thought, ooh, yum, yum. I was really afraid. This is what's so sad about me then. I was deeply afraid that I might get talked into having an affair with him, huh. that I would get talked into by him, simply because he was so powerful. Hmm. Not because I wanted a break in films or anything, nothing like that, hmm. but because he would just overpower me. I was really scared to death that I'd somehow allow myself to get trapped. When those things happened to you in Hollywood, and they did, how did you emerge? The only thing that saved my life, I, I know it, and I say this in my documentary, uh, was psychotherapy. Yeah. It was Marlon Brando, with whom I had a eight year on off relationship, who said to me one day, you really need help. Hmm. You need to see someone. 
Was was he at that point, or as you reflect on your life, was he the love of your life? Oh, he was the lust of my life. Marlon Brando was the lust of your life. My husband was the love of my life. Mm. Marlon was the lust of my life. Mm -hmm. And that part of it was exceptional. Mm. I, I, you know, <laughs> oh, wow, that was incredible. And he was, he was really also a very interesting man. He was... Yeah. Very funny. Mm -hmm. Humor has always meant a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. humor, humor to me is sexy. Mm -hmm. Why is it sexy? Because I always think that a man who can be fast on his feet with humor can protect me. I mean, to read about and to learn about your love, your lust for Marlon Brando at that time, yeah. that was so intense that it oh. actually drove you at one point. To take pills to try to do away with my life. That's right. That just took my breath away, Rita. Yeah, it took, nearly took mine away as well, permanently. He kept um, disappointing me. But you know, let's put things in proper perspective. You, you let things happen, all right? People don't, aren't just mean to you. If you keep letting them disappoint you and hurt you, then there's something wrong with this relationship, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. The straw that broke the camel's back, mm -hmm. as they say, this one deception, this hundredth deception, was in his bed, mm -hmm. asleep, and I thought, I can't do this to myself anymore. Mm. I, I just can't do this. I felt so humiliated. And I went to his bathroom and looked in the uh, medicine cabinet, and he took sleeping pills now and then. Mm -hmm. And I just stared at it for almost a half hour. And then I'd go back, and then I'd come back to the... I mean, it wasn't something impulsive Wow! in that sense. It took thought. It took a long time wow. because I thought, if you're going to do this, this is forever. This, this is going to be your last breathing moment. And I was in tears, huh. and I finally opened the bottle and put, I think, about 10 pills in my uh, hand and swallowed them. And I'm looking in the cabinet mirror all the time and saying, see, that wasn't so difficult. Oh, my God. Oh, it was, it was just horrific. Mm. And, you know, luckily his assistant, Alice, found me. Mm. But I was close. Wow. I was close. Wow. <sighs> God, I mean, I'm glad that's in the, in the I past. Am, I am too. Good morning, welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. When most people say your name, they immediately think West Side Story. Uh, Nobody worked harder for a part than you did. There is I 
had to audition in every aspect of that part. And uh, before I left the last audition, which was the acting one, that were, they were very pleased with, uh, he said, now, Rita, we have to do the uh, dance audition. And he said, I have to tell you honestly, if you can't cut that, you don't get the part. Oh, jeez. So I ran to the local dancing school and took lessons all day long. I could barely afford it. Jeez. But I was in that dancing school like from 9 to 6 in the evening to the point where one dance teacher said to me, don't come back to my class. He said, honey, you work so hard, you turn a funny shade of purple. She says, and I don't want anything to happen in my class. So <laughs> she said, you're out. It. Bye. And I remember going to yeah. the bathroom, the uh -huh. ladies' room, and looking in the mirror, and sure enough, I was the color of your <gasps> outfit. That's how hard you worked? It goes beyond red. I know you want the part. I get it. Yeah. But what drove you to that? I really felt it was my last chance to get something and do something that was meaningful. And I wanted that part so badly mm. I could taste it. Mm. And I knew, I knew I could do it just as <laughs> I just knew that I would be a wonderful Anita if they just give me, because I was Anita. Fast forward to Oscar night, your face when they announced your name. <laughs> And you know what I loved about that moment? I mean, it was your moment, but it was not just your moment. Oh, I love you for saying that. It was that. not just your moment. It was my people. It was your people's moment. Yes. Oh my God, they cheered in Harlem. They oh, cheered they all over. Oh, they went I have a girlfriend <laughs> who told me that she, was, she lived in Harlem at the time. Yeah. And she says, normally it's a raucous place. When he came up to say best featured actress, she said the place went, dead quiet. You know what that is in the ghetto? That's amazing. It's weird. Maybe it's the end of the earth, of the earth or something. And he announced my name and the place went up in mm. smoke, my oh. neighborhood. People yelling out the windows, she did it, she did it. And you know, as a friend of mine said, what they were really saying was, we did it. Oh God, that makes me want to cry. We did it. Fast forward to this moment in time, you got to witness another beautiful Anita Anita bring home an Oscar I, I was just I was I, but I'm not I wasn't surprised you weren't oh no, no. no. I kept hinting to her and I thought I shouldn't be doing this yeah. but I thought how can she not and then the reviews were insane <laughs> for her as they were for me I gave her every bit of support that I could don't think that I wasn't envious I was. You're so honest. I but love it. But what I loved about her being cast in it was Stephen picking an Afro-Latina mm -hmm. in the role. There are tons of us around. She's remarkable. However, she's working all the time. Uh -huh. I'm not. Yeah, you didn't get work for seven years or oh, so goodness, after. I could get some if I wanted to do more gang stuff mm -hmm. on a much lesser scale. But I suddenly thought, Maybe I'm just not being represented correctly. Mm -hmm. So with his permission, my agent who was at William Morris, I made an appointment with another agent at William Morris. She said, so what do you, what do you want? And she was kind of tough and mm -hmm. to the point. And I said, well, I was wondering, and it was this kind of thing. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, maybe uh, Maybe you might be interested in handling my career for mm -hmm. a while. And there was an instant and harsh no. And then I said, can I ask why not? Mm -hmm. She said, you won't believe this. I can't believe anybody would say this. She says, because I don't think you have what it takes. Oh Tell my you, God. the blood just drained from my <sighs> head into into a little pool around my ankles. And I said, thank you. <laughs> I said, thank you. How I didn't manage to burst into tears How? at that time, I don't know. I mean, I first of all, you had won the Oscar and, when and the, she said that? And the, uh, and the uh, Golden Globe. To emerge from that and to come out after that and still grab yourself a Tony and grab yourself a Grammy in spite of that. 
Like, that's inspirational. Like, how do you keep getting up? You just do it. Because you know you're talented. I do. Yeah. I actually, I've always believed, even at my most humble, and I was, let me mm -hmm. tell you, really humble, mm -hmm. uh, I always believed that I had good stuff and that I was talented, that I needed someone. And I was so right. I needed someone to believe in me. Mm. But I never had that person. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Not only did you win the Oscar, you're the first Latina to I win have the, them all. You got the EGOT. I have the EGOT. The Emmy. Emmy what's that? Uh, Grammy. Grammy. Oscar. Oscar Tony. Tony. And then the the uh, the one that really surprised me was the, uh, oh my gosh. Which one? The uh, the Peabody? Yes. You got the Peabody. It's, it's crazy. I mean, this is. I wish you know, my mom were here. <laughs> you know, it's you win all these awards. When you gave your Tony acceptance speech, you acknowledged not just who you had become, but who you were. You acknowledged Rosita. You oh. acknowledged. Well, I said, that's right. Yes. I forgot that. I said, I'm, not only am I proud, yes. but Rosita Dolores Alverio is yes. beside herself. Yes. Or something like that. Yes. Yes. That was, I just thought that was such a huge moment because it, you had not left anything behind, not that you ever did, mm -hmm. but to stand on stage and speak it out loud was something precious, I thought. Oh my God, yeah. oh, you're killing me. <laughs> Will you marry me if I propose? <laughs> I'll be good to you. I'll make you breakfast even. <laughs> you are so funny. <laughs> you know what I was wondering? You talk about the little you, the little girl in you. That's right, I call her little Rosita. Little Rosita. She's the one who still lives in me. You know, everybody thinks that once you've had therapy, Everything is swell. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. There's still a little, there's something in me, I call her little Rosita, who is always there to say, ha, 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 ha. I told you, I told you. Told and you what? I told you you couldn't make it. I told you you couldn't do it. I told you you'd be embarrassed. All that, that lives in me. Mm. And as I say in the documentary, the measure of being uh, mature mm -hmm is my ability now to send her to her room. Go to your room. And you're still but sending she's still her off. There. I don't think I'm completely healed and I don't think I will ever be. Mm -hmm. I think I'm fragile in certain ways still. Hmm. Very, very sensitive. I love that you never got hard. It could That's do it. That's not in me. That, I, you know, I, I thank God for that because yeah. honestly, I see a lot of people get that way. Because mm -hmm. I'm surprised with all, that, all the blows you took I remember thinking once when I was doing nightclubs in Vegas, and very often the, the audience would get up and stand up, and that's before it became the thing to do. And uh, I remember going to my room, flush with all that, and the dressing room was so quiet, mm. and there was nothing there for me, except my husband calling and saying, how are you tonight, how did it go? Mm. And I realized that then. I remember having a moment, an epiphany, as it were, that huh. I was very lucky. Huh. Wow. 
Lenny was with you for years. 46 years. 46 years. Yeah. You got the career and you got the guy. Most times you choose. Well, I got the guy, but then it turned into not a happy marriage mm. because I felt that, uh, you know, it's what I say. I, I don't want to repeat myself, but it's what I say in the documentary. People make deals with each other that are never verbalized. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really also afraid that uh, I would not be good on my own. So you on your own, your own voice, your own choices, your own decisions. Nobody's putting their thumb on the scale. Nobody's telling you what to do. Mm -hmm. How did you adjust to that life? Being on my own? Yeah. It was easy. <laughs> it was easy. Yeah. And it was, it actually, it, uh, it worried me because I came back, his, uh, his demise happened in New York when mm -hmm. I was in a hospital with him for about a month and a half, mm -hmm. sleeping on one of those hideous cots mm -hmm. where you can feel the floor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and I came home. I remember it was a beautiful sunny afternoon and my assistant was there, Judy, mm -hmm. and I said, give me a big glass of white wine. Mm. And I sat in my very pretty courtyard and I just took in the sun and I thought, I'm free. Mm. I can do anything I want now, mm. anything. You know what I'm struck by, what, what I find so inspiring in this conversation is your directness, your honesty. You say all the hard parts out loud. But you know you have to. You have to, particularly if you're in my business, which is full of lies and deception. For your own mental health, I think you have to be truthful. So as we sit here at 90 years old, what inspires you now? Like what kinds of things inspire you? Women. Yeah. Women. I, I, uh, I have such an appreciation, a deep appreciation of women and what they have to go through mm -hmm. to be uh, successful in life. And that doesn't mean stars. Mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean the head of corporation. Just handling their lives mm -hmm. and being a parent. Mm -hmm. That takes enormous amount of work and it's about time that we support it. See, I, that's what I love so much, mm -hmm. that we are supporting each other. Well, you've been marching and you've been fighting the good fight from the very beginning. You were there when Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. There are life-changing moments. not more than 15 feet away from him watching him do that speech. Why was it important that you were there during that I Have a Dream speech? Because it, it settled for me once and for all that I had a responsibility, mm. that I had advantages that many, many people didn't. And I'd been there when I didn't, mm -hmm. so I understood very well. Mm -hmm. I understood what this struggle was about. Mm -hmm. I just want to think about your cool life and the things you've, not just the things you've witnessed, but the things you've participated in. Do you, do you know at this point that you are that you're worthy of everything you've achieved and everything. Well, I certainly feel that I've earned yeah. everything mm -hmm. that is wonderful and yeah. good and a reward. Yeah. I absolutely feel that I, it, that, has not, I, that has not come cheaply. Mm -hmm. I've had to earn every bit of that, yeah. and I'm very proud of that. And lastly, um, you've, uh, as I keep repeating, you've changed the lives of so many people. Countless you'll never know. That's a, a, Most you'll never know. It's astounding. Um, what is <gasps> it? Oh, I've got to tell you Tell me. Else. I want to know. <laughs> I had done a television interview, and I talked about my attempt at suicide. Yeah. About a year later, I was walking into the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and I see somebody across the lobby, which mm -hmm. is huge, go. Mm -hmm. So I walked toward them and they ran toward me and they held my hands and they were in tears. It was a man. And he said, thank you. Huh. Oh, this is hard. He said, thank you. You saved my life. <laughs> oh, jeez. And uh, <laughs> that's when I thought, 
I, I just have to help in any way that I can. So, you know, words do have meaning, and when you mm. have people playing mm. with them and saying dreadful, untrue things, mm. it's heartbreaking. Well, you're a healer. You know what? I think I am. I think I am. A healer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we need Kleenexes <laughs> on aisle one. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. Today's Pop Start Plus feels like it's been a minute. Good to see you. Hope all's well. Coming up, we got a terrific conversation with a photographer who's captured images of the royal family for the past 20 years. He shared with us some of his favorite shots of the queen. We'll have that for you. Plus, we're going to also have uh, the third hour's chat with the guys of Impractical Jokers. And then a little bit later on, we've got a throwback clip from our vault with the talented and very young Drew Barrymore as the beloved E.T. turns 40. But first, Here's today's pop start headlines. First up, John McEnroe. We teased it earlier. The polarizing tennis grade is the subject of a new documentary that just premiered at the Tribeca Festival, simply titled McEnroe. The film gives us a look at the tennis player's absolutely wild career and sees him reflecting on his past. Mm -hmm. You doing your job, umpire? You're pathetic. How much bigger point can you screw it up with? Couldn't you see anything? From New York, John McEnroe. I was on such an unbelievable high. Number one in the world. I'm the greatest player that's ever played. Why does it not feel that amazing? John's a perfectionist. In his head, it's never good enough. I would dwell on tennis matches when I could have been a better dad. That's the worst feeling. You always hear, do whatever it takes to win, at any cost. Is it all worth it? Real good. Oh, good. I, I can't wait. You know how like athletes now wear the wear, like they know their heart rate at any time. Yeah. yeah. Imagine if he had that in his day. I mean, his, he must have been like. It would have broken. Yeah. You know, it would have like charge. popped off his wrist. Yeah, That's right. Like, McEnroe premieres on uh, uh, on Showtime September second. Definitely want to check yeah. that out. Next up, Stanley Tucci. We all know him as a talented actor with scene stealing roles in movies like The Devil Wears Prada and The Hunger Games. But he's also become known as quite the foodie, as shown in his incredible documentary series that I would love to be able to do. It's called Searching for Italy. He travels to Italy's 20 regions and just samples pasta and <laughs> eats tomatoes and cheese. And he's also been, you know, now a bit of a food expert, especially on Italian food. So when Today.com asked Mr. Tucci his thoughts on pineapple pizza, he did not hold back. Regarding the fruit as a pizza topping, Stanley Tucci said, I have no thoughts on it. It's so repellent. Were I to think of it, I might not survive. Yeah. It's just gross. Adding, where does it come from? Like, who's the guy who said this is a good idea? Not a boy, Mr. Pizza, Tucci. Anybody? Agreed. Co-sign. You like I agree. The, I, I, pizza? I, look, I like sweet and savory. Okay. I like. Do you like M and M's in your popcorn? Uh, it's not my jam, no. Yeah. That's you know what? Salt and sweet. There, you, I like those. If you combo. like it, it's fine. You're not forcing somebody that. else to eat it. Go with We're just God. debating. Yeah, but, but we don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. it. I don't like it. Good for you. But did you eat a Hawaiian pizza like from Domino's when nope. you were a kid? No. You didn't? And like you did, I did. Yeah. yeah and no one ever said that was Maybe a it's bad a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 California yeah. Pizza Kitchen. That's exactly right. 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 Yeah. 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 Sweet, savory. Come pizza. on. Next up, this is incredible. We're hearing more and more about Austin Butler, who's the young actor who took on the role of Elvis Presley in this upcoming biopic. I mean, this was before COVID. He was casted. He went method. He's got picture. Really studied. Not only does he look like Elvis, as you've seen in the trailer. This whole movie is going to span a lot of the King's career, including, of course, the early days in the music industry. We're hearing now that Austin Butler sounded exactly like Elvis, too. Not just looked like him, but sounded him. We've got proof. Presley's granddaughter, Riley Keough, revealed Butler singing some of the early vocals um, of, of Elvis. So what we have here is a behind-the-scenes video of him singing That's All Right. This is behind the scenes. We 
the show, but in this scene, like, you see crew members, like, walking in front mm -hmm. of them. So it's him and, like, the trio, and they're just, like, jamming. Mm -hmm. And you can see how Austin is just, Didn't like, you see becoming. It? Can I tell you? I saw it. Oh, you did? Yeah. It is incredible. It looks it's incredible. A Tom Hanks is off the yeah. chain as the colonel, yeah. playing yeah. his manager. I didn't know so many things in that that came into play. It was. It's it got, like, a 12-minute standing ovation oh. in Canada. It's I mean. going to be wow. amazing. Uh, Elvis yeah. Hits Theaters on June 24th. Quickly, Sesame Street is coming to the stage this fall. All of our favorite pals from the classic kids show is going to be featured in a new off-Broadway production. Oh, Elmo, Abby Cadabby, Cookie Monster, Grover, and all of them, all the fan favorites. Oh. Sesame Street songs will Ooh. be sung in addition to some new numbers that were written Jeez. just for this show. Producers saying the production is going to appeal to fans of all ages when it opens to audiences in September. Jeez. We're pretty sure we know some people wow. who are going. would like Got to it. go to this. Got it. Man. So, oh. Can't wait that. to see Elmo accept his Tony. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and a few more headlines for you. First up, my buddy Sean Diddy Combs, the music mogul, is set to be honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at this month's BET Awards. The three-time Grammy winners, known for hits like I'll Be Missing You, Bad Boys for Life, and so many more. He also founded Bad Boy Records in the 90s. He created the successful clothing line, Sean John. BET saying that Combs has been breaking barriers, blazing new trails, and quote, in so doing, raising the bar for all of us. Congratulations to Diddy on that one. Now to Lady Gaga, who may be getting into the comic book movie world. A sequel to the 2019 mega hit Joker, which starred Joaquin Phoenix, actually won him an Oscar for Best Actor, is on the way and could be coming a little sooner than we think. Director Todd Phillips posting this photo of Phoenix reading the script for the sequel, which is called Joker Folly Adieu. And now the Hollywood Reporter has revealed not only will the movie be a musical, but Lady Gaga is in early talks to take on the role of Harley Quinn, Joker's on again, off again crime partner. Margot Robbie played, of course, that role in recent years. This would be a different take on the Harley Quinn character. It could be Lady Gaga. We'll see how it all comes together. And that's the latest you need to know. Just ahead, a royal photographer reflects on 20 years of capturing photos of the Queen. Good morning, welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the playing, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, can we still have work to do? In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. You know they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And a royal photographer for Getty Images has the proof of that. He has the proofs of the proof of that, to be specific. Chris Jackson is his name, and he's been doing this gig for 20 years, capturing moments, both big and small, of the British royal family. And in the wake of this month's big Platinum Jubilee celebration, he spoke to us about some of his favorite shots of Her Majesty. I've been photographing the royal family for 20 years, and as we head into the Queen's Platinum Jubilee weekend, it's fantastic to look back at some of my favourite moments of the Queen and with her family. Absolutely, the Queen is my favourite person to photograph. She's just got this incredible aura and presence to her. And I think what is so special about that, she really understands what it means to the people she's meeting on the day, how important it is to them. For her, it's just another day's work, but for them, it's the moment they meet the Queen in, in their lives. And I think, you know, we look at her wearing bright colours. She stands out in a crowd. Some people only catch a glimpse of her. Other people get to shake her hand. And I think the realisation of what, what she represents and what she means to other people is, is clear to her. And for me as a photographer, she's 
just incredible to photograph and every opportunity to have is special and, and, and a really amazing experience so that's what makes it quite unique there's one of the queen which i really like and um, which she, she's in kind of um a purple dress and she's got a kind of slightly unusual expression this particular photo is one of my favorite photographs for the queen because it's slightly unusual and it really kind of illustrates what is so important about photographing the queen it was taken in an opening of a maternity ward at the list of hospital and and there's a lovely background and the lights falling in a nice soft way and it almost looks like it looks like it's taking the studio and the, the reason that i find this very special is every sort of day-to-day -day royal engagement you may or may not get a picture that stands out in the royal collection for sort of tens or maybe even if you're lucky hundreds of years to come and this was just a sort of day-to-day -day royal engagement but everything came together in a moment to create something a, a little bit different. And that's what I love about photographing the Queen. You know, she is this iconic, historic person. If the light falls in the right way, if you're lucky to get a nice background, something a little bit different, you might get an image that sort of lives on in the collection. And, you know, that certainly doesn't happen every day. But of course, you know, we're looking forward to the Platinum Jubilee weekend and the four day bank holiday in the UK that we're going to be celebrating. There's so many events to look forward to, but the actual day of the, the Queen's accession, the passing of her father was the 6th of February. And this picture sort of represents that moment. And it's the Queen working on her iconic red box where she gets her notes and letters and, and where she does her work. And she's up at Sandringham in Norfolk, somewhere she feels, you know, uh, incredibly relaxed. That's what stood out for me and, uh, you know, it's always an honour to be asked to take any photographs like this, so it was very special. So Trooping the Colour, the Queen's official birthday, is really one of the most important moments of the year for a royal photographer and it's, it's one of those kind of touch points where we see the royal family together on the balcony watching the fire pass, but we see them, we look back year after year and it's like kind of a reference point, I suppose. You watch the children grow up and you see um, the Queen at the centre of this, this growing family and it's the look on the royal faces as they look up at the, as, as the RAF flyer above them is, is really special. So it's definitely all the pomp and ceremony and the best that Britain has to offer on the day. This particular photograph I took at Trooping the Colour, it was a, a kind of pared down Trooping the Colour in the grounds of Windsor Castle, in the quadrangular Windsor Castle during Covid. And of course, it wasn't the normal Trooping and Colour, which of course is the Queen's official birthday celebrations. But this enabled me to sort of capture a slightly more creative moment, I suppose, using a slow shutter speed and getting the soldiers marching past the Queen. And it's, it's quite difficult um, as a royal photographer to try and create something a little bit different because you're so constrained by time and, and often sort of positioning. But this was something a little bit different and um, I was kind of happy with the results. So that was, that was something um, a little bit more creative. This is one of my favourite photographs of the Queen and, and Prince Wales and Duchess of Cornwall. So taken at the Highland Games, which is one of my favourite events to photograph up in Scotland, where this, the Queen and members of the royal family spend their summers. Clearly somewhere the Queen feels incredibly relaxed. And this particular photo was taken, I think, during the tug of war, um, during the Braemar Highland Games. I think this, the team had just fallen over and the Queen and the Prince of Wales, that's the Corm and the Duke of Banner had burst into hysterics. And it was just such a lovely moment and it's one of my, definitely one of my favourite ones, the highlight of the year. Yeah, so it was a real privilege to take the, the, the Queen and the Duke of Banner with the 73rd wedding anniversary photograph in Windsor Castle in the Oak Room. You know, and it was during a difficult time after a Covid lockdown and to see the Duke's face when he opened a card from his great grandchildren, Prince George, Princess Charlotte and Prince Louis. And it's, it was that link between the generations at a time that was really difficult for people during Covid. And, you know, it's, it's a more candid picture and I think it tells more of more of a story, but to reach a 73rd wedding anniversary for any couple is an amazing achievement. The Queen has a lifelong love of, um, of, of animals and dogs and horses in particular. And of course, she's had her corgis and her doggies. And um, there's some lovely photographs of the Queen with with um, with her dogs. And it's clear something that makes her happy. And of course, horses we see her at Royal Ascot at the Windsor Horse Show. And this is something that certainly makes her happy. And her passion for horse racing is probably you know, absolutely her number one um, pastime and, and, and that can't be denied. So it was fantastic to see her this year uh, when it's been a little bit more difficult for her to attend events with her mobility issues. So 
There were some lovely photographs of the Queen watching uh, the event from her car. I suppose one of the special things about being a royal photographer is watching and documenting the royal families, watching the changes, watching them grow. For me, the most incredible thing is being photographing, you know, uh, royal births and christenings. There's nothing more exciting than that, you know, moments of national celebration. A new member of the royal family could be the birth of Prince Louis or Prince George. And of course, you know, milestones for the Queen, such as the Diamond Jubilee. It goes to show how how the Queen has this incredible ability to bring together the nation. Uh, we'll all remember her speech during COVID and how she was broadcast into the, the living rooms of the nation. She really inspired everyone to, to try and look on the positive side of things. And she has that amazing ability and unique ability. So I have such fond memories of the um, Diamond Jubilee. So looking back at that period and how, you know, the whole nation was we're celebrating this moment and this period. And this is why I'm looking forward so much to the Platinum Jubilee, because being a royal photographer, being at the forefront of these moments of kind of national and global celebration, you know, people all around the Commonwealth, it's just amazing. It's such a feel good factor. And I'm so looking forward to photographing um, all the different events for the Platinum Jubilee. It's going to be a really busy weekend and, and I'm really looking forward to it. Some incredible work there. And a big thanks to Chris for sharing those photos and all of his talents with us. Coming up next, the hilarious guys from Impractical Jokers. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. If you've ever seen Impractical Jokers, you're familiar with the show's hosts, Brian Q. Quinn, James Murray, Murray and Sal Volcano. And now there are new episodes of their hidden camera show to enjoy, and they spoke to our third hour all about them. We are back now with three funny friends, James Murr Murray, Brian Q. Quinn, it's weird to say it in the middle of your name, and Sal Volcano, <laughs> also known as the Impractical Joker. Oh, yes, for nearly a decade, they have been cracking us up with their hilarious, sometimes cringeworthy, hidden camera pranks. It's the one show all five of us in my family will sit down and watch. <laughs> oh, wow. They're back with new episodes from their ninth season. Oh, my goodness, this week. This time, some special <laughs> guests get involved in their punishments, including when SNL's Colin Joe set in for a high-stakes spelling bee. <laughs> She's ready, and she knows how to spell. <laughs> Brian, your word is... Kyphoplasty. <laughs> oh my God, look at this dog, cannot wait. You got bandages nearby? Uh, K, Y, Fo? P H O? P L S T I I C Y. Oh, I'm <laughs> so very sorry. That is incorrect. 
Hey, don't uh, end it there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, we know he survives. <laughs> yeah. Sure Dude, Sal, Sal good morning. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. See you guys. It's so nice to have you guys here. I remember, Murr, last, I mean, it was seven years ago. Oh, you were celebrating gosh. your 100th episode, and we got to learn how to walk a tightrope You did together. much better than I did. I was terrible. <laughs> well, then you guys, you know, did it for real. But, I mean, here we are. You're in the second half of the ninth season. Oh You're gosh. about to film your 10th season. How do you keep coming up with new stuff? How do you do it? I just keep a log of their tendencies, <laughs> and then I work against that. <laughs> it, never, it never ends. It's just like any day that we think of anything, I write it in my notes, and then we bring it the next day. Like, you know, so I, saw, I, saw, I saw this happen. Let's do it. Today. They electrocuted me this season. Ouch. <laughs> so, the ideas can keep coming. That, you know what that, I mean? That, that, Usually you can only do that once. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we might be running out of we're at electrocution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's that might be the bar. What, to what you guys did to me, they had me put an adult apparatus in my posterior section that they controlled via an iPad oh. and it had four settings smooth jazz, earthquake, tsunami and hurricane. <laughs> oh my god. He was on a television panel much like this and no no one was the wiser. Oh, oh my yeah. god. Yeah. Yeah. Except for Method Man who was sitting right next to him cracking up at him every time he started going. Oh wow, one of your, your Staten Island pals. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We had to get him on. When we started inviting guests on I mean he's been a hero to us our That's entire awesome. life so we had to get Method Man. He was yeah. great. So, so I would imagine not every one of these setups always lands well. <laughs> yeah. Now, why you would you say that? Well, I, I understand there's a couple of examples of that in this season. Oh, uh, 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 well, of it not working well? Yeah. Well, there was a former one where we, we had to baby talk to... Uh, <laughs> all right, so you know how people baby talk to children? Yeah, yeah. Right. The idea was that we'd have to baby talk to adults, and if they baby talk back to us, you know, you win. And so we're like, where can we do this? So we went to a children's park, because that's where the children are yeah, with the small. adults. And <laughs> the only thing is that we didn't have kids. Oh. And after a few moments of... Because we were going to talk to the kids and then transition to the adults. Oh. You know, as a... And right. then uh, they called the... the was it the uh, SWAT, SWAT team? team? Yeah. yeah. It was like out of a movie. It was basically like 10 cop cars came right away because someone was like, there's just random dudes in here, baby. <laughs> 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 that makes me feel a little safer. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I feel like the cops should have been called. Yeah, exactly. They're, listen, in this city, they're all over. If it's baby talk, they're all over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I love it. Uh, I was, you, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was good. I, no, you go ahead. Well, you mentioned Method Man. I was looking at the, and we just showed Colin Jost. But then you have Brooke Shields. Yeah. I mean, it's like everybody now wants, I told you, wants to be a part of the magic. I, I'm putting this out there for the world to see. <laughs> Michael Bolton, you if Michael you're Bolton? out there, we're big fans. Come on, Impractical Joe. Yes, please. <laughs> Michael Bolton, if you're watching, and we know that you are. <laughs> Joe Gatto, this is the first batch of episodes you guys have done without Joe. We know that he said he was leaving the show for, you know, to focus on his, his personal life. Uh, can you tell us how he's doing? Is he okay? Yeah, we yeah. talked to him uh, daily, really. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's doing great. He's out. He's doing a tour now. You can go see him on that. Yeah, he just needed a little more time off, and he's taking it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's doing good. You guys describe, you know, the the humor between you all as being able to punch sideways. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Well, how important is it to poke fun at yourself? Uh, it's the most important thing. <laughs> I, I, we we've said like that, that's that's the way because you know we grew up in the '90s, so things are a little different. That like the way we tell each other that we yeah. love each other is by making fun of each other. We don't say nice <laughs> yes. things to each other, See, no, but we tell each other that we love each other. Yeah. yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah. People make fun of me for teasing him, and it's like no, it's the only way I to do it. it. So we say we don't punch up. We don't punch down. We punch yeah, sideways. We're the butt. We're always the butt of the When you guys show. first started the show, did you ever imagine it would be the hit that it is? We imagine yeah. this exact yeah. reality. <laughs> this is going to plan right now. Yeah. We said we'd be on the show today. <laughs> this is how you knew it would be. Yeah, yeah. Yes. As you get ready for next season, who would be your dream Ooh. guest? Besides oh, Michael Bolton. Besides Michael Bolton. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've been trying to get uh, Bruce Campbell from uh, uh, the Evil Dead movies, oh, uh, yeah. Sam Raimi's guy. He's been my hero since I was a kid, so I've been trying to get him, but so far, nothing. But Bruce. If you're, you're watching. Watching. if you're watching and we know you are, are. Yeah. <laughs> please. I'll That's put out a, just a cast of line to Melissa McCarthy and Jack Black. Oh. Oh. Wow. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. There you go. Ago, you should have been on the show yeah, last week. Here. Here. Anyway. Wow. Guys, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. It's, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, Impractical Jokers returns to True TV this Thursday, June 16th, 10 p.m. Guest star, Colin Jost. Great to hear from that daring trio. They're so funny. Up next, from our vault, Drew Barrymore from her back in the E.T. days, which, if you can believe it, celebrates 40 years. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And 
good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And we're back now on Popstar Plus. This year, as I teased, marks 40 years since the beloved movie E.T. hit movie theater. So today we thought it'd be fun to revisit the 80s with a great clip from our vault featuring a very young Drew Barrymore, who, of course, played the adorable Gertie in E.T. One of the most popular movies in the history of motion pictures, E.T., and one of its stars, Miss Drew Barrymore, who is with us this morning. So what, what kind of a watch have you got there? Well, it's actually E.T. It's an E.T. watch. Yes. How many times have you seen the movie? I've seen it 10, 11 and a half times. Tell me about the half a time. Well, we got locked out of a studio. You got locked? We, we went to this um, screening at Universal, and the, it was like one minute late. We, actually, it started one minute early. That's right. So we got there on time, but they didn't tell us when they started one minute early. So the, and then the, the extras that played the stunt boys on E.T., they got locked out too, so we were, my mom was <laughs> pounding on the door until someone came. Do you remember how you got the role in E.T.? Well, they interviewed me for Poltergeist first, and she said she's not really like the girl who's in the part in the script. So, so Kathy Kennedy, the producer of E.T., said, well, maybe she's right for E.T. Because he was, he was doing E.T. and Poltergeist at the same time. So he, um, he interviewed me for E.T. and he, he said, he's, I'm much more like the girl in E.T. and he said, she's just right. So I got right. the part. I was talking to Stephen not long ago, and he said that when you auditioned for Poltergeist, you had to scream, and you didn't feel like screaming. But then when you, he remembered you, and when you came back to audition for E.T., he explained to you that you would also have to scream at least once in E.T., when you see E.T., and he said, you go home. What did he tell you exactly? Did he tell you to go home and practice screaming? Well, I, it was kind of hard at the time because I was kind of, I got sick. Oh. So I, you know, I tried, I tried. I tried real hard to scream, and I, you know, he didn't say practice because he didn't want me to lose my voice. Oh. So I said, okay. He said, but uh, I said, I'll say, I'll, I said, I'll be as prepared as possible. So did you scream pretty well? Yes. Can you scream anytime you feel like it? Could you scream if I asked you to scream? Let's hear you scream. <laughs> That's a pretty good scream. Wow, I may not hear the address of this interview. <laughs> it's a very good scream. Thank you. When you were in England, you met Princess Diana and Prince Charles, huh? Yes. Tell me what that was about. Well, I went to England, and I had to do the premiere for the opening in England. And the princess, Princess Di, walked to me, and I was waiting for my turn. So... So she finally came to me, and I presented her an E.T. doll. And Henry presented her flowers. And at, 
you know, Prince Charles came and said, hello, Drew. And then, you know, he laughed like Santa Claus. He is a very nice man, too. Prince Charles laughs like Santa Claus? Really? And at one point, he, could, he, he just could not take it. He laughed so hard. At one point, Princess Diana had to pat him on the back, calm him down, and she whispered to Stephen something, and he said, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is during the movie? Yes, uh -huh. in England, the premiere. Drew Barrymore, I hope you have a wonderful life. Thank you. And a wonderful career. Thank you. And I thank you very much for visiting with us here on today. Well, that's okay. I, 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 I had very much fun. Talk about a throwback. And of course, we love Drew around here. So congratulations to Drew and everybody associated with ET. 40 years, that's hard to believe. All right, that's going to do it. Pop Star Plus is done. Another one in the books. We hope that you'll come back. Join us again. A little bit later this week, we're going to go behind the scenes with the director of the number one movie in the country right now, Jurassic World Dominion. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, look who came back. Oh, today, all day. Nation, thank you for returning to our digital show, a little show we call Today in 30. Because yeah. why? Why? It's 30 minutes long. Is that why? Yeah. All right, we've got so much to cover. So here's what's coming up. We're going to start with... Troubling new signs for the economy amid soaring inflation, prices, and turmoil on Wall Street. We'll have the very latest. And also the key decision on interest rates facing the Fed this week. Tom Costello will update us on everything we need to know. Also, we're going to bring you part one of our exclusive interview with Amber Heard. This is her first since the Johnny Depp trial. Today's focus, her reaction to that verdict in favor of her ex-husband, and how the case played out on social media and in the court of public opinion. Plus, have you heard that class reunions... They are back after the pandemic for so many cancellations. A lot of schools are making up for lost time. Vicki Wynn will share some great advice so you can make the most of those long-awaited celebrations. Got all that and get ready to laugh because the Impractical Jokers visited the third hour to talk about the hilarious and high-stakes pranks they've been pulling in season nine of their hit show. Oh, those guys are funny. All right, let's go. It is time for Today, Today in, in 30. 30. NBC's Tom Costello is in D.C. for us this morning. Hey, Tom. Hi, Hoda. In fact, for weeks, we've been expecting the Fed to raise rates by half a point tomorrow. But after that very discouraging inflation report last week, the pressure is on the Fed to go big. And now the Wall Street Journal and CNBC report the Fed could raise rates by three quarters of a point. That's a much more dramatic and immediate rate hike. The decision comes tomorrow as the Fed tries to get 40-year high inflation under control and fast. Wall Street's closing bells sound cheery, but a dark cloud is hanging over the markets and the economy. Red arrows across the board and a big slide on Monday. Overall, just an ugly day. The Dow Jones Industrials closing down 876, now 16% lower for the year. The tech and biotech heavy Nasdaq down 30% year to date. And the broader S&P index, common in Americans' portfolios, sliding into bear market territory, down 21% this year. Real money that Americans invest to one day retire, pay for a kid's college, or a new house. The advice from most financial experts, despite the high stress and the anxiety, if you have a long-term time horizon, don't panic. The advice for most people is just stick it out. Don't try to change your portfolio now. Meanwhile, more Americans in more states are hitting the so-called pain point, where gas tops $5 a gallon, forcing them to cut back on driving or spending. I've already curtailed my driving as it is. As inflation takes a huge bite out of almost every American family budget, clothing up 5%, housing up 5.5%, food up 10% in one year, new cars up 12.5%, used cars up 16%. Outside Detroit, Briz Brown had to find a closer daycare for her son as she takes on a second job delivering groceries. It's hard to keep food on the table. Uh, the rent prices are going up. It's hard to keep roof over our head. Even utilities are going up. The Federal Reserve, the nation's central bank, under intense pressure to stem inflation after failing to act sooner. Now expected to raise interest rates tomorrow to slow inflation. The Fed has to worry about whether or not it can stick to those game plans and whether or not Wall Street will believe them down the line. That's why Fed credibility, so to speak, is so key right now. So if there was another interest rate uh, hike, Tom, how much of an impact would it have on people's wallets just in the short term? 
Well, we're expecting new mortgages will get more expensive, refis, home equity loans, car loans. Before the Fed's rate hikes, a $400,000 mortgage would typically carry about a monthly payment, $1,700 or so. That new car loan, or that new loan today, rather, $2,400 just because of the rate hikes already, and it will go even higher as the Fed raises rates. Interesting, you know, the, the Fed has really only one tool here. It's a sledgehammer to try to bring inflation under control. It's not a surgical knife, Hoda. Yeah. Okay. All right. Tom Costello for us there in D.C. Tom, thank you. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back, 7.30 Tuesday morning, 14th of June, 2022. It is Flag Day. Mm -hmm. And our corner of Rockefeller Plaza is all decked out for the occasion. I, I'm impressed. We all just started singing Grand Old Flag. I learned that in elementary school, Me, did you? The problem is it, I don't know anything after like the first 50 words. Grand, grand Old Flag. flag. She's, she's a high-flying flag and forever in peace may she reign. See, that's why I dropped She's the emblem okay. of okay. the land I love, the home of the free yeah. and the brave. Every heart means true, or the red, white, and blue, and the blah, blah, blah. I can't believe that went on. That, is, that was really impressive, ladies. I can't Come on, believe it. Really oh, wow. Okay, so All it's right. Flag Day, so All right. yes. let's honor our flag. Okay, yes. we, we do want to begin this half hour, though, Savannah, with your exclusive interview with Amber Heard. Yeah, that's right. This is Amber Heard's first interview since that high-profile defamation trial and its stunning verdict largely in favor of her ex-husband, Johnny Depp. We spoke about what happened in that courtroom and how she feels about all of it now. It's been about more than a week since the verdict. As you sit here with me now, has it sunk in? <sighs> How could it? It's surreal and difficult in part, yes. Um, this has been a long time coming. Do you stand by your testimony and your accusations against Johnny Depp about abuse. Of course, to my dying day, we'll stand by every word of my testimony. The real-life drama of the defamation case between Amber Heard and her ex-husband Johnny Depp captivated millions of people around the world. Amber Heard just got exposed. Johnny, you hit me. This is so cringe. With clips spreading across social media like wildfire. I think vast majority of this trial was played out on social media. I think that this trial is an example of that gone haywire, gone amok. And the jury is not immune to that. You think they, the jury saw it? How could they not? I think even the most well-intentioned juror, it would have been impossible to avoid this. People online and crowds outside the courthouse made it clear where they stood. Every single day I passed for three, four, sometimes six blocks, city blocks lined with people holding signs saying, burn the witch, death to Amber. After three and a half weeks, I took the stand and saw just a courtroom packed full of Captain Jack Sparrow fans who were vocal, energized. Can you put into words how that 
felt. This was the most humiliating and horrible thing I've ever been through. I have never felt more removed from my own humanity. I, I, I felt less than human. Let's go back to the, the day of the verdict. Were you feeling confident? <sighs> That's a great question. I wish I could say yes to that. I want to say yes to you, but it, would, it wouldn't be true. Even if you think that I'm lying, you still couldn't tell me, look me in the eye and tell me that you think on social media there's been a fair representation. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. After the six-week trial, the jury found her defamed Depp in a 2018 Washington Post op-ed in which she wrote she was a public figure representing domestic abuse. She never mentioned her ex-husband by name. Depp denied the abuse allegations in court. Heard won just one of three claims in her countersuit against her ex-husband. That verdict came less than two years after a judge ruled against Step in a similar case in the UK, in which he sued a British newspaper that called him a wife beater. There was another trial handled it in, with the same, dealt with the same substantive issues that had even more evidence in. In fact, mine, my evidence was largely kept out, really important pieces of evidence kept out done differently, handled differently by a, a judge instead of a jury. Some evidence is admissible in a UK court that is not admissible in a US court. Do you think that maybe he just had better lawyers? I will say his, his lawyers did a, certainly a better job of distracting the jury from the real issues. For some people, they just were frankly disgusted by the whole thing and don't have much sympathy for either one of you. Can you understand that? Absolutely. I would not blame the average person for looking at this and how it's been covered and not think that it is Hollywood brats at their, at their worst. I'd, but what people don't understand is it's, it's actually so much bigger than that. This is, uh, this is not only about our First Amendment right to speak. But here's the thing about the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects free speech. It doesn't protect lies that amount to defamation. And that was the issue in the case. Yes, exactly. You can't go into, the free speech does not protect you if you, you know, go into a crowded theater and you scream fire. We get the concept of free speech from the Greeks. My understanding of what that means is not just the freedom to speak. It's a freedom to speak truth to power. The truth is the word. Yes. And that was the issue. And that's all I spoke. And I spoke it to power, and I paid the price. In the closing arguments, the Depp lawyer said, called your testimony the performance of a lifetime, and said you were acting. What do you say to that? Says the lawyer for the man who convinced the world he had scissors for fingers. I'm the performer. I had listened to weeks of testimony uh, insinuating that or saying quite directly that, you know, I'm a terrible actress. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit confused how I could be both. The Depp team argued that you were the abuser, that you instigated physical violence. Did you? I never had to instigate it. I responded to it. When you're living in violence and it becomes, it becomes normal, as I testified to, you have to adapt. You say you were responding, but there are, is evidence. There are tapes in which you acknowledge hitting. There are tapes in which you say, I started the fight. I know much has been made of, of these audio tapes. They were first leaked online after being uh, edited. What you would hear in those clips are not evidence of what was happening. It was evidence of a negotiation of how to talk about that with your abuser. But I am looking at a transcript that says, he says, you start physical fights and you say, I did start a physical fight. I can't promise you I won't get physical again. 
I mean, this is in black and white. I understand context. But you're testifying and you're just telling me today, I never started a physical fight, and here you are on tape saying you did. As I testified on the stand about this, is that when your life is at risk, not only will you take the blame for things that you shouldn't take the blame for, but when you're in an abusive dynamic, psychologically, emotionally, and physically, you don't have the resources that, say, you or I do with the luxury of saying, hey, this is black and white, because it's anything but when you're living in it. But then there are other times, there's another tape where you're taunting him and saying, oh, tell the world, Johnny Depp, I, a man, am a victim of domestic violence. 20-second clips or the transcripts of them are not representative of even the two hours or the three hours that those clips are excerpt from. Could your side have just put the whole three hours in then? I'm not a lawyer. As I testified to, I was talking in those recordings as a person an extreme amount of emotional, psychological, and physical distress. He and says he never hit you. He can't. Never. Is yeah. that a lie? Yes, it is. What about the witnesses who said they have seen you instigate physical violence? I've seen firsthand how people will file rank and support the person they depend on. Did they all come in and lie in court? I am not here to call any of his witnesses any names. I'm here to just kind of talk about it from what it felt like for me as a person who sat there. When I asked his lawyers, why do you think you won? And the answer I got was because she never took responsibility for anything she did in the marriage. I did do and say horrible, regrettable things throughout my relationship. Uh, I behaved in horrible, almost unrecognizable to myself ways. There's so much, I have so much regret. I freely and openly and voluntarily talked about what I did. I, I talked about the horrible language. I talked about being pushed to the extent where I didn't even know the difference between, you know, um, right and wrong. I will always continue to feel like I was a part of this, like I was the other half of this relationship because I was. And it was ugly and could be very beautiful. It was very, very toxic. We were awful to each other. You know, I made a lot of, a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. But I've always told the truth. Hurd's lawyers say they plan to appeal that verdict. And as for the notion from Hurd that there was evidence allowed in that UK trial that could have potentially made a difference last week, Depp's attorney said here on today that the evidence presented in the latest trial far exceeded the UK one, two different processes, and they believe the jury got it right. Well, we have a lot more of our conversation to share with you tomorrow morning on today, including Hurd's response to some of the other allegations made about her in court and her answer when I asked how she feels about Johnny Depp now. We've got lots more of that. Our exclusive interview with Amber Heard will also air on a special edition of Dateline. That's mm -hmm. Friday night at 8, 7 central. There was a lot to talk about. Um, and we'll continue the conversation yeah, tomorrow. So, yeah. so enlightening. Yeah, it really was. All lots right. to unpack from that. Yeah. yeah. Thank All you, right. Savannah. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? 
do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back on the plaza with the return of a long-running tradition that was mostly put on hold because of the pandemic. We're talking about class reunions. Yeah, so they're back. They're back now in full force <laughs> after many celebrations were put on hold for the past two years. Yeah, NBC's Vicki Wynn is here with more on the big reunion boom. Vicki, good morning. Hey, what did you do? Hey, good morning. You're amazing. <laughs> Fun to be out here yeah. on the phone with the peeps. <laughs> That's right, guys. It is officially reunion season. This year, plenty of classes are making up for lost time. After two years in limbo, many are eager to see old familiar your faces as reunions make their big comeback. This summer, more people are heading back to school. The nation now seeing a class reunion rebound after the pandemic forced many to press pause on high school and college homecomings. Some reunion planners are even seeing business boom by as much as 25% over their pre-pandemic dealings. And they say this year, 25 to 50% of reunions are either rescheduled or combined events with other classes who also had to postpone their gatherings as a delayed wave of alumni arrive back at their old stomping grounds. I don't care if you like us, because we don't like you. But for many, the focus isn't the high school drama. The past memories are, are locked in a box, and when we access them, uh, they bring us joy. We're coming to you straight in front of the PHS campus. For the past two years, Mike Wolf and Stephanie Warner have been working to plan their 20-year reunion for Poway High School's class of 2000. Obviously, the pandemic uh, put a kibosh on certain things. And so after like three or four reschedules, revisions and, and redos, we're, we're on. They'll now host a unique 22-year reunion in San Diego and admit there are some jitters. We're all going to be a little nervous. I'm going to think about what I'm wearing a few couple different times. Experts say that anxiousness you might feel before reuniting with old friends is not uncommon. Concerns about not measuring up to expectations or being put in uncomfortable situations often make us feel like we're in the spotlight and being judged by those around us. But that is rarely the reality. People are rarely judging us as much as we think they are and that they're a lot more focused on themselves and how they think they're coming off socially. To knock out those nerves, experts say invite a friend. A familiar face can make you feel more secure and comfortable in larger groups. Making others feel like they belong by engaging in conversation will make them feel welcome and can also take the focus off of you. And cut yourself some slack. Keep in mind our brains tend to amplify embarrassing encounters, making them seem worse and preventing us from embracing all the excitement. I think seeing people in person will actually just remind all of us we're all humans, we're all going through these experiences, and it's so great to be together. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel foam? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What would you like to see from the federal government to keep Buffalo safe? If there is legislation brought to you to ban contraception, would you sign it? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who's this? 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are back now with three funny friends, James, Murr, Murray, Brian Q. Quinn, it's weird to say it in the middle of your name, and Sal Volcano, <laughs> also known as the Impractical Joker. Oh, yes, for nearly a decade, they have been cracking us up with their hilarious, sometimes cringeworthy, hidden camera pranks. It's the one show all five of us in my family will sit down and watch. <laughs> oh, wow. They're back with new episodes from their ninth season. Oh, my goodness, this week. This time, some <laughs> special guests get involved in their punishments, including when S. SNL's Colin Joe set in for a high stakes spelling bee. She's ready and she knows how to spell. <laughs> Brian, your word is kyphoplasty. <laughs> oh my God, look at this dog, cannot wait. You got bandages nearby? Uh, K Y FO P H O P L S T I I C Y. Ooh, I'm <laughs> so very sorry. That is incorrect. Wait, don't end it there. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, we know he survives. Yeah. Good work. Dude, Sal, it. good morning. Good morning, brutal. guys. Good morning. Good to see you guys. It's so nice to have you guys here. I remember, Murr, last, I mean, it was seven years ago. You yeah, were I celebrating your 100th episode, and we got to learn how to walk a tightrope You together. did much better than I did. I was terrible. <laughs> well, then you guys, you know, did it for real. But, I mean, here we are. You're in the second half of the ninth season. Oh You're gosh. about to film your 10th season. How do you keep coming up with new stuff? How do you do it? I just keep a log of their tendencies. <laughs> and then I work against that. <laughs> it, never, it never ends. It's just like any day that we think of anything, I write it in my notes, and then we bring it the next day. Like, you know, I, so I, saw, I saw this happen. Let's do it. They electrocuted me this season. Ouch. So, the ideas can keep coming. That, you know that, what I mean? Usually We're, you can only do that once. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we might be running out if we're at electrocution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 I think yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that might be the bar. What, to what you guys did to me. They had me put an adult apparatus in my posterior section that they controlled via an iPad oh. and it had four settings smooth jazz, earthquake, <laughs> tsunami and hurricane. Oh, oh my god. god. He was on a television yeah. panel much like this and no no one was the yeah. wiser. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my god. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Except for Method Man who was sitting right next to him <laughs> cracking up at him every time he started going. Oh wow, one of your, your Staten Island pals. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had to get him on. When we started inviting guests on, I mean he's been a hero to us our That's entire awesome. life so we had to get Method Man. He yeah. was great. So, so I would imagine not every one of these setups always lands well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, why you would you say that? Well, I, I understand there's a couple of examples of that in this season. Oh, uh, 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 well, of, of it not working well? Yeah. Well, there was a former one where we, we had to baby talk to... Uh... <laughs> All right, so you know how people baby talk to children? Yeah, right. The idea was that we'd have to baby talk to adults, and if they baby talk back to us, you know, you win. And so we're like, where can we do this? So we went to a children's park, because that's where the children are with the adults. And the only thing is that we didn't have kids. And oh. after a few moments of... Because we were going to talk to the kids and then transition to the adults, you know, as a... And then uh, they called the... the was it the uh, SWAT, SWAT team? team? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was like out of a movie. It was basically like 10 cop cars came right away because someone was like, there's just random dudes and he had babies. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel a little safer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like the cops should have been called. Yeah, exactly. They're, listen, in this city, they're all over. If it's like baby talk, they're all yeah. over. Yeah, uh, yeah. I love it. Uh, just, you, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was good. I, no, you go ahead. Well, you mentioned Method Man. I was looking at the, and we just showed Colin Jost. But then you have Brooke Shields. Yeah. I mean, it's like everybody now wants. I told you, wants to be a part of the magic. I, I'm putting this out there for the world to see. <laughs> Michael Bolton, you if Michael you're out Bolton? there, we're big fans. Come on, in practical jokes. Please. <laughs> Michael Bolton, if you're watching, and we know that you are. <laughs> Jill Gatto, this is the first batch of episodes you guys have done without Joe. We know that he said he was leaving the show for, you know, to focus on his, his personal life. Uh, can you tell us how he's doing? Is he okay? Yeah, we yeah. talked to him uh, daily, really. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's doing great. He's out. He's doing a tour now. You can go see him on that. Yeah, he just needed a little more time off, and he's taking it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's doing good. 
You guys describe, you know, the the humor between you all as being able to punch sideways. Yeah. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, how important is it to poke fun at yourself? Uh, it's the most important thing. <laughs> I, I, we we've said like that, that's that's the way because you know we grew up in the '90s, so things are a little different. That like the way we tell each other that we yeah. love each other is by making fun of each other. We don't say <laughs> yes. nice things to each other, See, but that's we tell each other that we love one each other. Yeah. I, I understand that. Yeah. People make fun of me for teasing him, and it's no. like it's the only way to do it. it. So we say we don't punch up. We don't punch down. We punch yeah, sideways. We're, the butt. we're always the butt of the When you guys show. first started the show, did you ever imagine it would be the hit that it is? We imagine yeah. this exact yeah. reality. <laughs> this is going to plan right now. Yeah. We said that we'd be on the show today. This is how you knew it would be. Yeah, yeah. Yes. As you get ready for next season, who would be your dream Ooh. guest? Besides oh, Michael Bolton. Yeah. I, I, I've been trying to get uh, Bruce Campbell from uh, uh, the Evil Dead movies, oh, uh, yeah. Sam Raimi's guy. He's been my hero since I was a kid, so I've been trying to get him, but so far, nothing. But Bruce! If you're, watching, you're, watching. If you're watching, and we know you are, yeah. <laughs> please. I'll put That's out right. a, just a cast of line to Melissa McCarthy and Jack Black. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there you go. Ago, you should have been on the show yeah, last week. Here. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a blast. And don't forget, Impractical Jokers returns to True TV this Thursday, June 16th, 10 p.m., guest star Colin Jost. Hope you come back yeah, tomorrow. We're going to have more of our exclusive conversation with Amber Heard. Plus, Dakota Johnston is stopping by. So we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Hey, today all day, up next on Hashtag Cooking, Samadada is saying bye-bye to boring avocado toast with two of her favorite avocado-packed recipes. Then she'll banish sad desk lunches forever with a savory turmeric oatmeal and crispy cauliflower popper. Hey guys, it's Sama. I am so excited to share two of my favorite recipes with you today. They both use an avocado and they're both from my new cookbook. So let's get hashtag cooking. First up, we're gonna make my avocado cream pasta and then next for dessert, because we always have to have it, my avocado brownies. And yes, I did say brownies. This avocado cream pasta is literally one of my most popular recipes on my blog and I honestly think it's because you just need a blender to make this super luxurious sauce. I'm just gonna slice these tomatoes in half. You can totally leave them whole to roast them if you'd like, but I'm just gonna slice them so that we can get that nice caramelization around the edges. Now I'm just gonna arrange them onto my baking sheet. I've lined this with parchment paper. These rogue ones wanna be left behind, but they won't be. Now I'm just gonna drizzle with a little bit of olive oil and season with some salt and pepper and red pepper flakes. Olive oil, some red pepper flakes, a little salt and then some pepper. We don't wanna roast these tomatoes for too long, only about 10 to 15 minutes. If you do roast them for too long, it will dry out those juices and we definitely don't want that. We want a juicy tomato. Okay, looking pretty good. Now that my tomatoes are done, I'm just gonna leave them here to hang out while I prepare my pasta. All right, very important. Please promise me you won't forget to salt your pasta water, okay? Just promise me. I'm gonna salt it, and now I'm gonna add my pasta. Straight in there. And while this pasta is cooking, I bet that I can make the sauce in the time it takes for it to be done. All you need is a blender to make this super creamy sauce. So if you've ever made a smoothie and you have a blender at home, you can make this pasta sauce. So the base of it is our avocados. I'm using an avocado and a half for this recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with that. Just slicing my avocados, making sure I also don't slice my finger in there. All right, we're gonna scoop some of this avocado out. Look at how ripe and pretty that is. Go straight in there. Gonna pit this. This avocado is what's gonna add that super creamy element to this pasta. Now I'm gonna move on to my lemon, adding the juice of one full lemon in here. Make sure I catch all the seeds. 
This lemon is gonna really make it tart and acidic and bring out that zing, make it very bright and fresh. I'm gonna add some fresh basil and raw garlic. Yes, I'm using raw. It's gonna be really punchy and really bright. And I love garlic. There we go. A Little bit of olive oil. Just a bit. And now I'm gonna season it to taste with some salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Salt in there. Add as much chili flakes as you'd like. I love spice, so I'm going in with a lot. But you make your own choices, okay? Now, just to help everything get moving in the blender, we're gonna add a little bit of cold water. Make sure it's cold because we don't wanna brown the avocado. Just a bit, and I can add more and adjust to get it to the right consistency that I like. Now, it's time to blend. Perfect. It is so luxe, you will not even believe it. Look at that. So creamy. Did you see that? I made that pasta sauce and my pasta is done. Super quick. We love a blender recipe. Now I'm just gonna spoon my pasta out. Before I add this creamy sauce to my pasta, I'm gonna grab one more thing. Just grab some arugula from the fridge. I love adding this to this pasta because it gives this really nice peppery bite to it. All right, time to assemble. Got my sauce, gonna add this into my pasta. You might think you put cream in this, but you didn't, I promise. I'm just gonna really stir that in. I'm gonna add my tomatoes. Just a little burst of something sweet in with this avocado cream sauce. Now I'm just gonna mix in my arugula. What's great about this pasta as well is that you can eat it immediately, but you can also refrigerate it to have as a pasta salad the next day. We love a leftover. We love a meal prep situation. This is both of these. All right, time for me to plate this for myself. Is that too much? It's never too much. <laughs> What is a portion? <laughs> I have my tomatoes that I reserved just for this moment. Place them on top. Make it look really nice, a little pop of color. And now, some freshly ground black pepper and a pinch of flaky sea salt. And that is it. But one last thing. Can't forget to take a photo. I didn't do all of this for nothing. I love this. I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna put this on my wall. I think it's fair to say that it's time for me to eat. Okay, here I go. Gotta get some arugula, some pasta in there. Okay. Mmm. I love myself. <laughs> it's so creamy, you honestly would never know that there's no cream or butter in this. It's crazy. Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans, nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, 
Download the NBC News app. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We are so used to thinking of using avocado in savory recipes, but plot twist, they're amazing and sweet recipes too, especially when chocolate is involved. And that is where my avocado brownies come in. I've already preheated my oven to 350 degrees and now I'm gonna prepare my pan. I love parchment paper, I live for parchment paper. I've already greased my pan here with some coconut oil and now I've created a little strip of paper that I can just lay in to my pan stick it down because the coconut oil really helps it stick. And then I've created these nice little flaps which are gonna make it super easy to remove the brownies from the pan when they're done baking. I've got great news. For you and for these brownies, everything comes together in a blender. Like you could make a smoothie, but don't. Make these brownies instead. All right. We're starting with my avocado, star of my show. Gonna slice this in half. Great way to use avocados when you're sick of the guacamole, when you're sick of all the savory things that you've been making with it. What's really nice about using an avocado in this brownie recipe is that it's super creamy and rich, so it actually serves as a really nice butter replacement and you cannot even taste it. I promise. All right, avocado is in. Time for the rest of my ingredients. I'm using two eggs here. And Park that straight in there. And now I'm gonna add some creamy peanut butter. You can definitely use an almond butter if you'd like, but I love peanut butter. So we're starting with all of our wet ingredients first. Gonna sweeten this up with some maple syrup and some coconut sugar as well. And then a little bit of vanilla extract. So now I'm just gonna blend everything together here and then get to work on my dry ingredients later. I'm using an almond flour for this recipe because I think it's really nice and dense and cakey, which is gonna be really delicious with these brownies. Add my almond flour in there. Now, we're gonna use a cocoa powder. Make sure you get an unsweetened cocoa or a cacao powder. We want it to be really pure here with nothing added because we've already sweetened it with some coconut sugar and maple. Oh! Now some baking soda. Isn't it so convenient? Like, just a blender and brownies are the result? Sign me up. A little bit of salt. This is gonna be really nice to bring out that sweetness and also balance out that chocolate. And now, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna blend. You may need to scrape down the size of the blender to get it there, but just be patient with yourself and your blender. All right, we're looking really good. Now I like a little bit of a sweeter brownie, so I'm gonna fold in some chocolate chips. You don't have to do this if you don't want, but if you like joy and happiness, I would highly recommend it. I'm gonna reserve a few chips on top before baking so we can just get that nice aesthetic before it goes into the oven. You know how I operate. I'm gonna fold this in. How easy was this? Can we take a moment to address how easy this is? And now all I'm gonna do is transfer it into my pan, which I've prepared already. Look at that. You would never know there was an avocado in here. We put a whole fruit in these brownies and you can't even taste it, I promise. I smooth the batter out in the pan. Make sure it's evenly distributed. That looks pretty good. And now for my chocolate chips, I'm gonna add them on top. Less is not more here. That's my philosophy when it comes to chocolate. Less is just not more. In fact, more is more. All right, so now we're ready for the oven. And they are done. You can tell that the brownies are done when they start to pull away from the sides of the pan a little bit and a knife inserted in the center comes out clean. I'm so excited about this. 
And again, I love parchment paper. This is so easy. I'm just gonna lift them straight out of the pan like this. Pretty good form, huh? I'm gonna slice these, big piece for myself. I'm gonna top it with some ice cream and peanut butter because I love myself and I deserve this. It's such a clean cut too. Who needs a gym, <laughs> right? I, wanna, I need a bigger scoop. <laughs> All right. And now I'm just gonna top it with a little peanut butter drizzle. I just melted this in the microwave for a little bit so it gets nice and melty and easier to drizzle. I think this looks perfect. Pretty good. Now, last step. Just gonna top it with a little bit of flaky sea salt. Partially for taste, partially for aesthetics. I just have to take a picture of this. I need to document it. It looks too good not to. Okay. That little drip right there? Is that a joke? Okay. Now I need to try this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm gonna just leave. <laughs> it's so crazy. There's no butter or oil in these brownies, but they taste so decadent and rich. Who gave me permission to do this? Avocado. Really came through today. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. At 73, Prince Charles is still waiting for the job that is his birthright. Do we want Charles? Do we want a monarchy? I'm Keir Simmons, and we'll take on these questions and more in our new podcast, Born to Rule. Listen now. From New Orleans, well, nice to go spend some time with you. Appreciate it. cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Lunch is sort of that lost meal in between breakfast and dinner where you don't really know what quite to do with yourself. So, in order to make your lunch exciting, I'm gonna hashtag end sad desk lunches and show you two of my favorites. First up, I'm gonna show you how to make some delicious spiced breaded cauliflower poppers and my favorite savory oatmeal with caramelized onions. To be honest, cauliflower is truly in everything these days. We see it in pizza, we see it in pasta, it's probably in ice cream, I don't wanna know about it. But the best way to use cauliflower is in these cauliflower poppers because you know what? They can literally do it all. They're a great snack, a great appetizer, and a yummy lunch, especially when paired with a delicious salad. The key to the cauliflower poppers, it's in the almond meal. Make sure you're buying the one with the skin still on the almonds. I find this adheres a lot better to the cauliflower, making it really nice and crispy. 
I want this breading to be super flavorful on its own. I don't want it to just act as a sidekick. So I'm gonna add some spices. I'm gonna add my almond meal straight into my bowl. And then I'm adding my favorite spices, some cayenne, some cumin, and some turmeric. Finally, we're gonna add a little pinch of salt. Now, time to just whisk everything together. The turmeric's gonna give it a really nice color as well. It's gonna be really nice and yellow and pretty. It's gonna make this cauliflower glamorous. Make sure it's really well incorporated. All right, this looks really nice. Now I'm gonna whisk up some eggs. I'm using two eggs here. We need something for the breading to stick to, so that's why we're gonna make this little egg bath situation. Perfect. Whisk that up. Okay, this looks pretty good. And this is my favorite part, we get to assemble. So I have half a head of cauliflower cut up into florets, and now I get to just assemble. Using my tongs, my favorite kitchen tool. Gonna stick this straight into the eggs. Roll that around nicely. You want it to be fully coated. Let any of that excess egg just drip off. We want a nice even coating, so that's why we're doing this. And then it's gonna go straight into our almond meal mixture. Let the breading really coat the cauliflower well. We want it all over the cauliflower into all the little nooks and crannies. And now, just gonna transfer straight to our parchment lined pan. See how easy that was? That's crazy, that was so easy. We can all do this. And now I'm just gonna repeat with all of the other cauliflower florets. Make sure you're shaking that excess almond meal off as well. We want a nice, even coating. Pop that straight on the sheet. These are sort of like cauliflower wings. So if you're plant-based, if you're vegetarian, even if you're not, it's kind of a fun and new way to get a veggie in your life. You can also totally use your hands for this. I'm being very neat and clean today. I don't want to crowd anyone on my pan here, so this is going to be my first batch. I am so excited for these to get into the oven. I'm gonna bake them at 350 for about 30 minutes until they're nice and golden and crispy. Well, they're ready. Just FYI, I did flip them once halfway through baking so we can get that nice and even crispness on both sides. I really like to pair this with a variety of sauces. I like to have a sauce flight, a lot of choices here. You can really use whatever you'd like, whatever sauce suits your mood. It's also really great if you wanna eat it solo. I mean, this is what I do at home, so I actually eat them straight off the pan. That's the fact. It just is this really gorgeous almond-crusted exterior. Oh, it's so good. There is really nothing this cauliflower cannot do. I'll stand by that forever. Oh, I have to take a picture. I mean, come on. They're begging to be dipped and snacked on. I'm going in. Mmm, that masala on the breading, it's spicy, it's flavorful, and I'm like eating a vegetable. Like, what? You never know. Welcome to today. We have a lot to get to this morning, guys. Did you feel calm? About the time I stopped the plane, that's when it hit me. One of the biggest names in music. Give it up for Harry Styles. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. 
Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. When you think of oatmeal, you're probably thinking, wow, that's such a breakfast move. But I have to disagree because oats are actually the perfect base for anything savory and grounding and delicious. I'm gonna show you how to make my really hearty, savory turmeric oatmeal with caramelized onions, avocado, and egg and peppery arugula. It is so good. So let's get started. The first thing I wanna do is caramelize my onions because that's gonna take the most amount of time. So I'm just gonna dice them up right now. If I cry, it's not because the onions. It's because I'm really excited to make this, just so we're clear. I'm just gonna heat some olive oil in my pan and start on this caramelization. Adding some olive oil. Now that the oil is shimmering, I'm gonna go ahead and add my onions. Caramelizing the onions is gonna create this really nice full-bodied flavor. It's also gonna add a little sweetness. So oats themselves don't really have a lot of flavor. So by adding all of these different elements, we're really gonna create our own flavor profile here. We're gonna let these caramelize for about 15 to 20 minutes so it gets a really nice deep golden color and then we're gonna get to work on our oatmeal. What's really great about caramelized onions is that you can make them in a huge batch, freeze them so you'll always have some on hand. I'm gonna let these hang out, get really delicious and caramelized, and I'm gonna go grab some of my greens. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes. Can you even believe these onions? They look so good. They smell even better, if you can believe it. And now, I'm just gonna upgrade them a bit with some of my favorite spices. I'm gonna add my cumin straight in here. And then my turmeric. And I really just wanna toast the spices in with the caramelized onions so they become nice and fragrant and any of that raw spice smell goes away. And finally, can't forget them, my salt and pepper. I'm gonna just roast these for a few minutes until they smell really fragrant and aromatic. And then we're gonna move on to my oats. Now it's time to cook my oats. I'm actually going to be using vegetable broth to cook them in. You can totally use water if you'd like, but I find that veggie broth makes it a lot more flavorful. I'm using rolled oats here, just by the way. Give it a little stir, bring it to a boil, and let the oats absorb all of that liquid. We're boiling. Make sure you stir the oats while you cook them. It's a really aggressive boil. The liquid is reducing, the oats are thickening up. I'm gonna reduce the heat. Now, because you have so many savory and grounding flavors here, I want something a bit fresh, a little peppery bite, and that is where my arugula comes in. I'm just gonna stir in a handful here. You can choose however much you wanna add. I like a lot of arugula, so I'm gonna kinda go for it. You just want it to wilt, and then we're gonna take it off the heat. Now it is time for my caramelized onions. You thought I forgot about them. How could I ever forget about them? I'm gonna add them straight into my oatmeal. Give that a nice stir so everyone becomes friends. Now I'm just gonna remove it from the heat and add all of my toppings. Okay, now I'm just gonna transfer my oatmeal to my bowl. Can't leave any oats behind, that'd be so rude. I mean this color though. 
Gotta give some props to my turmeric. Really making that magic happen. I'm adding a few things here. I like having a lot of textural elements here, so I'm gonna add some creamy avocado. It's gonna contrast those oats really nicely. I'm gonna add an egg, soft boiled egg, and maybe some more greens. We'll see how I'm feeling. I'm just gonna slice my avocado. First, I wanna just take a moment. Okay. These were kind of fat slices. I will say I didn't intend to make them this, like, chunky, but you know what? I'm just lunching at home. This is real life. The avocado doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm gonna add my egg. I'm using a soft boiled egg here. I mean, I, do I need to say anything? I'm just not. I'm gonna let that speak for itself. A little salt. All right. Little pep. And finally, to finish it all off, some herbs. I'm using some cilantro here, but if cilantro freaks you out, you don't like it, I know it scares a lot of people, and that's okay. Like, that's totally fine. Use parsley, omit it, whatever you wanna do. I'm not gonna judge you. This looks like a pretty fat lunch. She's stunning. Um, you know who's gonna be jealous? Basically all of my friends. So I'm gonna have to send a picture to them, show them how cute my lunch is. Maybe it'll inspire them to make their own cute lunch. Okay, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to taste it. I wanna make sure I get a little bit of everything. Some of those oats, the onions, the avocado, the egg. Mmm. I wanna congratulate us all because we can now say goodbye to sad desk lunches forever. on Wall Street after stocks slip into alarming territory and Americans feel the ever-increasing pain of soaring prices and inflation. This morning, the mounting fears of a recession, the pressure on the White House.